form, I'm going to call to order the town council meeting, uh, the town council committee on outreach, communications, and appointments to order at 9:33 a.m. So you have in your packet with you um, our agenda. Uh, it looks like a pretty full agenda, um, but some of the issues refer to similar things, so we'll take some of the things as packaged together. Um, as far as announcements, uh, I do not have any announcements at this time. Uh, so we will move on to the second thing, uh, which is the debrief on Zoning Board of Appeals interviews. And so the last time that I saw all of you was on April 16th when we were conducting our interviews of applicants to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we, that was a very long night for us, um, and not just for us, but also for Athena and Angela, who uh, were there with us uh, until almost 11 p.m. And so I want to thank uh, staff, and I want to also thank the members of this committee um, who were there into a pretty late hour. Uh, we haven't, as a council, done that yet, so you were probably missing it, and so here we are. <laughs> So um, we have that recommendation. Hopefully you've gotten an opportunity to see the report. It's been both in our um, SharePoint and then also in the town council's packet. Um, but I just wanted to provide us with a, a brief opportunity at the beginning to do a little bit of a debrief, uh, much as we did for the planning board interviews. Uh, and part of the reason for the debrief, of course, is that we're going to be handing this process off uh, in the not too distant future. And so I'm trying to collect any sentiments we have about, um, one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to do is have a, when this committee does start to sunset, um, have a document that we can give to the other committees um, that are gonna be taking on appointments that's more than just our process document um, with some tips on how, how best to do these things. And so um, any thoughts on how you felt the ZBA interviews went, um, good, bad, uh, things you think we need to keep in mind for planning board interviews, things you want to make sure that we tell uh, the next committees that take on these interviews. Floor is open. Okay, I'm seeing none. Oh, Alyssa. Oh, surely we can say something. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I think it, it's a small thing in the larger scheme, but I think it helped make things go smoother is I think it's important to write down for interviews to get as part of the, it's not so much our process exactly like step, step B, step C, but it's like the chair's notes kind of thing, which is that the introduction that you gave as to how we got to where we were, I thought was really valuable to place everything in context for all the applicants, to remind all of us, for the public, et cetera, right? Rather than just saying, okay, we know we're all here to do interviews, let's just do them. Um, mm -hmm. You explained how we got there, and I think that we should document that that's an important thing because I think people would be more confused. It was clear that one of the applicants was still confused and didn't know what was happening on some of the things, but that wasn't your fault. And so um, having that stated, I think provided a really good context for people. And as part of that, having us introduce ourselves, I think was also useful because it's true, even when we go back to, as we all know we will someday, in-person meetings, that we would make sure we do that then too, rather, you know, just because we have nameplates in front of us, it, it's also pleasant to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, other thoughts on things that, or just thoughts generally on how the interviews um, or even the deliberation after went? Alyssa, again? Sorry, I found another one. Um, I was okay. trying to flip back and forth with my notes, which was, I'm, I know we talked about time limits. I'm not sure we did that night, and it kind of all worked out. But again, as part of the, you know, crib notes to self as person running the meeting, uh, reminding people of the time limits because I've, we've all been in other circumstances where people have no sense of how long they're talking for. Yeah, I, I was so the email that I sent out to the um, applicants in advance of the interviews that had everything said that there was a three minute time limit. Um, and I did, I did keep track. Most, most people were coming in at like 52 seconds to a minute. We had actually, um, 
in what I thought was a pretty stark contrast to the planning board interviews, very short answers. There was only one person who went over the three minutes and um, I let them go over for a little bit. And then as I was about to say, okay, um, that's when they, um, they finished up. Uh, but I let them go over a little bit because they clearly had a hard time starting. So, um, and then of course there was the one with the technical difficulty, which was very hard to time as well. Um, but yep. I'm just saying that it, for the for the future person's notes who may not be as good as facilitating things like that as you were. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on how the ZBA interviews went? Okay, I'm not seeing any. I, I personally thought that things went pretty smoothly. Um, especially, uh, I, I've said this multiple times over the past months, uh, relative to planning board, the ZB, setting up these ZBA interviews and all of that was uh, a much bigger uh, task. We had more people, we had more vacancies, we had differences between associates and regular members. Uh, we had people who entered the pool literally a week before the interview um, started. We had people who withdrew from the pool um, even after we had declared the pool sufficient, it was a very complicated process of setting that up. Um, and so I think that having that complication helped work out some of the kinks that we hadn't necessarily thought about or discovered in the planning board process. Um, but I thought that it went well. And I was also, of course, worried how it would transfer over to Zoom, um, with the one exception of my internet giving out midway through the interviews. Um, I think that Overall, it went pretty smooth, so I was pretty happy with how things went. Uh, George, and then Darcy. Um, just a quick question about mm -hmm. um, the aftermath. Uh, did all of the, uh, um, have we, we haven't heard from any of the uh, candidates one way or the other, it's just we assume that uh, they're all still in the mix? I reached out to, um, so I reached out immediately after the interviews about 11.30 that night to all of the people who interviewed, thanking them for interviewing and letting them know what the um, recommendation was. I heard back um, from several of them off the top of my head. I don't remember which ones. I know Peter responded very quickly. I know Keith responded very quickly, um, just thanking us. Um, I know probably, or perhaps I'm assuming the root of this question would be um, Bob Greeny who um, during the interview, there was some confusion as to whether he had withdrawn or not. Um, as you'll see in, in the report, I did have a conversation with him afterwards um, in which he said that in light of his comments during the interviews, he would accept the appointment. So okay. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard back from all of them, but they've all been, no I, I notified them immediately. I always prefer to have them hear from me before they read it in the paper or hear from their friend. Uh, Darcy. <coughs> Yeah, um, I felt like we worked together uh, pretty well at the at the interview and the and this the second meeting where we voted um, more so than I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and, um, but a couple of comments I have. One is um, I missed having the question about um, background and training and experience. Um, I, I felt um, um, like there were people that had training experience that didn't get a chance to talk about it at all because it wasn't one of the questions. Um, and also I was, um, I was surprised uh, when Sarah gave the information about Keith, uh, Keith's um, previous service on the on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I, so I, that was all news to me, and I felt like, wow, if we had asked the question about his training and experience, we would have known all that, um, and that, so that was news to me. I didn't, I knew nothing really about his background and I didn't remember it from before. So that was, uh, and it was only, 
you know, a fluke that Sarah uh, happened to know that background information about him and could share it. So anyway, um, I felt like, uh, I, I still feel like that's a valuable question to ask. Okay. Uh, George, is your hand up procedurally or? No, or I'm my fault. I'll get it down. Okay. Uh, Alyssa. Yeah, so a couple of things to string together. One is I actually disagree on the qualifications, but I don't think we need to fight about it much because we're moving into the statement of interest conversation later today. And I think that also covers it. I think that I knew the information about Keith's previous service and I of us Googled all of these people on the town website and elsewhere to see if they ever written letters to the editor about their assumptions about the way development should work if they'd ever appeared at meetings. I just consider that part of my due diligence. So I did know that information. Um, when it comes to the applicant sharing it as part of the question, I mean, even with doing the statement of interest, obviously there's be interview questions and I would still argue that everybody had plenty of time with the kinds of questions we asked to tell us about those qualifications and the reason I emphasize that is because I don't think we are as good at interpreting what people's paper qualifications are and how those apply to ZBA versus what the applicant can do with interpreting their own personal qualifications for that so if they chose not to speak about it that's too bad but I don't think that us having a list that says I did X, Y, Z tells us really any more than they could have told us. But again, we'll be moving on to the statement of interest thing and that could certainly cover that material as well because we could be very directive in the statement of interest. The only other small things is just as you said, Evan, you called people or emailed people right after either way. I think that should be documented as part of the process because like you said, you don't want them to find out in the newspaper and that's been a criticism of town manager appointments in particular in the past that people haven't known, not only not walking out, but also before it gets on the town council uh, thing. So it's worth documenting that even though we all understand it. I think it's especially important since a new body's gonna be taking that on, whether it's immediately at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> or the next morning is another matter, but I think they need to know it, you know, as quickly as they can. I also uh, would like a note made about rotating who starts answering the question, right? Like you did. But I also think that could also be um, also made more finely tuned and we did it in a kind of different way associated with the school committee candidates, which we had just done that week as well, which was that we still had the same people following people in most of those cases and I didn't really feel like that felt good because I would rather people follow different people sometimes and really I kept track of these charts it's not that hard to do but it is another step so it's worth considering and the other thing I would mention is that one of the criticisms that we faced and so that's why I like to put this kind of thing in a report is one of the criticisms we faced by having one person ask the questions and not have additional questions from us or from other town counselors or the public or whatever is that there's no opportunity for follow-up questions I didn't feel like I missed anything by not being able to say what do you mean by that I, I, I did not feel that lack and so maybe it's questions were so good or um Uh, Sarah. Oh, unmute. So I have a headache. Oh, and now you can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We're all good. We can hear you. We can see I you. I have a migraine. I'm so sorry. Okay. So one of the things that I would say is that um, I don't think it was, it was necessarily just a fluke, a fluke, a fluke that I remembered. Um, about Mr. Langsdale, it was information that we um, we all did have. I would say the only thing that I would say about that is um, when we we do discuss a little bit more about you know exactly what we do want to have for questions or what we're going to pass on is um, 
whether or not this body thinks, you know, that there should be term limits, right? So if we then end up saying, yeah, we do think that there are term limits and it's something that we, we take into consideration, then maybe you want to have that documented in, you know, the information that's given to the appointing body. Um, I would agree with Alyssa that the things, Evan, a lot of the things that you've done, I think are very thoughtful. I think that um, both you explaining the entire process, both how we got there, how this body would then ask questions and then how we would decide, I think was excellent and made things very civil and very comfortable. I would document every single thing you did, even if you think it's obvious. Um, Trying to think if there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, and also, I don't know how this translates or how we would write this in, but I think that when all of us got together afterwards, and I think this is true of pretty much any time that this body has tried to make a decision on appointing, is that I believe we're very civil um, to each other and also in how we discuss the candidates. Um, I, I know um, just from having, you know, put my name up one time for um vice president of of town council is that how you're treated by the people who are sort of evaluating you or making decisions has a lot to do with your own self-esteem and also how you feel about working with that body or in this case working with amherst town government so i don't know the words that we would use to sort of describe like how the deciding body uh discusses things afterwards, but maybe that's something we could talk about just to give people guidelines, because I think when you're new to it, there might be some sort of civilities or niceties that you just might not think of because you haven't done it before. That's it. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so a couple things um, uh, that I was thinking about after as well, um, if I could share some of my thoughts on this. Um, I agree with Darcy, first of all, I think that we worked very well together. Um, and so I felt pretty good at the end of those, uh, of that deliberation with our recommendation. Um, we had a disagreement over uh, a, a year term limit. Um, so that, that's, that was a pretty minor disagreement um, relative to all of the other things that could have happened. Um, one thing I was thinking about was uh, with planning board, um, we had seven questions, two of which sort of could be answered by yes or no. We had three candidates. I had allotted an hour and a half for that interview. Um, as you all remember, that resulted in us sitting uh, in an empty room for a very long time waiting for the next meeting to start. Um, so this time I had allotted an hour for the interviews um, and, and we did the thing where the second meeting was scheduled to start essentially a half an hour before it actually did. So that's something I think that needs to be continued is that potentially overlapping schedule so we don't have a big gap. Because um, I think it was nice to just sort of roll right into it. Um, we had five questions. Uh, we had seven candidates. The interviews total took about an hour and a half. Um, and so I think, to me, I was thinking about the fact that um, by the end of that hour and a half, I was pretty much done. Um, I did not want to listen to any more interviews. I should I should give this as the preface. Alyssa knows this, but I don't know the others do that. I'm also serving on a university search committee who also did all of their lecturer interviews that afternoon. So I was going into our meeting coming out of four hours of interviews. Um, so perhaps I was just interviewed out. Um, but, but I do think there's something to consider for the future about um, thinking about the number of questions you ask in the context of the number of candidates. So if we only had two or three applicants, maybe there would have been some flexibility to add some more questions in. With seven, I think that would have meant very lengthy interviews. And so I don't know that that's something you can write into the process. Um, and especially because you don't always know the full pool when you have the question. Certainly our pool expanded and contracted multiple times between when we declared it sufficient and when we actually held the interviews. Um, but I do think there was something that I, I was thinking during the interviews that by the time they were over, I thought I wouldn't have wanted to add any more questions because that would have just been a long time um, for us and to ask them to sit in. And so I don't know. I think that's something to always think about. I don't know that you can formally write that into a process of number of questions should have some relationship to number of people. Um, I think that the questions we asked were really good. 
I, I thought we got a lot of useful information out of them. Um, I, Jersey, I'm not, I'm not actually quite clear on what you mean by you didn't know about Mr. Langsdale's history until Sarah, I don't actually remember what Sarah said um, off the top of my head. Someone asked the question about how recently he had served um, okay. on the ZBA and Sarah knew the answer because she interviewed him the last time. Okay, right? so it was, it was about how recently he had served, not that he had served. Right. right. Um, so, so overall, I think that there's a lot of good stuff to, to take out of that experience to pass on to other groups and I've taken notes. Um, and so my hope is that for uh, potentially our next meeting um, to come forth with some type of document of uh, notes or tips or guidance to hand over to the next committee um, to remember so that uh, I, I'm, rec I'm recognizing how much, and I was thinking about this, how much stuff I did over the past couple months and how much stuff even we talked about as a committee that wasn't necessarily written into the process that we adopted. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that's passed on. Okay, so then I want to hand, um, go to uh, item four on our agenda. This is really quick. This is just update on planning board appointments for terms expiring June 30th, 2020. So there are three uh, members of the planning board whose terms are expiring um, at the end of June. Uh, so a couple things that have happened since we last met. So one is I have posted the vacancy notice. I did use the language we discussed about maybe appointing um, to reflect the fact that uh, we don't know if we have vacancies yet. We don't know if every member who's currently there is going to be uh, seeking reappointment. Maybe they are, and we know we do have uh, somewhat of a preference for reappointment, but we do treat an expi any expiring term as an intended vacancy. Um, that was published on April 21st, um, and so we are still within that 14-day window um, when, it, uh, when it's up there. I, I didn't, uh, so that was the first thing I did, was I published, the, I wrote and published the vacancy notice. Um, it looked very similar to the last planning board vacancy notice, just with that addition or that change that said May to reflect the fact that there technically isn't an open seat. Um, the other thing I did is I went through um, all uh, planning board CAS for the past two years. Um, this was much easier than last time because we had just gone through this process. And so I already had a list of all of the CAS for the past two years and we haven't um, received very many since we've last run this process. Um, and so I have reached out to every person who submitted a CAF in the past two years for the planning board. Um, to ask if they are still interested. Uh, I have not heard back from anyone. I've heard back from a fair number of people. The majority of the people I've heard back from um, have reported that they are no longer interested. Um, and a big portion of that is there is a lot of overlap between people who applied for the ZBA and people who applied for the planning board. And so there are a number of people who were just recommended for appointment to the ZBA and the next day got an email from me saying, do you wanna serve on the planning board? Um, and they said, please, please no. So, um, so I am still waiting on that. I don't feel, um, I did not feel that we were at a point today where we could uh, declare the pool sufficient to move forward because I don't necessarily have a full picture about what the current members are doing. You know, for some of them, not for all of them. I'm still waiting to hear back. And I haven't necessarily heard back from uh, enough people that I reached out to to feel comfortable moving forward. Um, but though that, that correspondence is out there, and so my hope is by our next meeting, I will have a fuller picture of what a potential pool looks like and we can look towards scheduling interviews uh, for the planning board. And my hope is to have um, a planning board appointment um, potentially by the end of May, or, or whether they're reappointments or new appointments. Uh, so any questions on that? Again, this isn't necessarily something that we need to debate. I just wanted to update you and, and field any questions. Alyssa. Um, have you been able to speak with each of the current people whose seats are expiring from the standpoint of them understanding our new interview process? And have you gotten any pushback on that that you'd like to characterize? Um, I have not. So um, right now, there is an... Um, there was an email sent out from Christine 
Um, and so my first course of action was, was um, to have Christine as the conduit of whether or not they're interested in continuing. Um, and I was waiting to hear back from that. Um, but at this point, I'm probably going to reach out to them individually. But I haven't actually personally reached out to the current members yet um, because there was sort of an outstanding request from Christine and I didn't want them to have multiple requests. But given that I have not heard back from uh, a couple of them, uh, I will likely reach out personally. And, and with, with the caveat that they would also include some description of, of what the new process looks like um, because they've only gone through the process as it existed with the select board and the town manager. So you're referring to Christine Breaststrap, our director of planning, Sorry, as opposed Christine to Gray Christine Gray Mullen, the current chair. Very confusing. I know yes, it's very Christine true. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions about um, planning board? Okay, so seeing none, we will get to sort of the, what the bulk of our agenda is today. Uh, so items five and six, uh, I separated out as two separate things because they are separate, but I do think we should talk about them together. Um, and this is building on a conversation that we had last meeting about um, what to do with the CAF. This is, we, we first talked um, as a body about potential revisions to the CAF uh, in September, um, and it's been a recurring conversation since with the hope of um, submitting to the council some recommendation on how to uh, make the CAS more useful to the council um, and resolve some of the remaining disagreements about them. Uh, you all remember the memo that I submitted last week about a potential idea to um, revise the CAFs to be just expressions of interest without necessarily asking a number of questions and having a statement of interest um, to uh, get information from people at the time of an interview. And so uh, at the end of last meeting, there was a sense that I at least got from this committee that this committee was interested in at least um, investigating that proposal a bit more. And so what I told this committee I would do for this meeting uh, was to draft some potential revisions both to the CAF and to our process that reflect the discussions we had. Um, and I also said that where it seemed that there was disagreement or a few different options, I would lay out some different options, much as I did when we were discussing the uh, process originally back in November and December. So those have been in your packet. Uh, I think I put them in your packet on Wednesday. So my hope is that you have had some time to read through them to think about them, um, and so I want to discuss them now. Uh, even though on the agenda I list the revisions to the CAF first before the discussion of the process, I think that um, I want to actually do the opposite and start with the process because uh, once we decide that, that will probably make what we do with the CAF itself much easier. Um, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to why don't I share my screen and so we can all be looking at it on my screen uh, at the same time. Okay, so you should all be seeing my screen now with um, the document that you've had in your packet that had the potential revisions to the process if we were to move forward with this. So there are changes to a number of sections. There are a couple of changes that were just, I recognize little mistakes as I was going through this, um, but the substantive changes are really in sections two, a little bit in section three, and then this new section five is where there would be um, really the most changes. And then a little bit in section seven, um, part of that is clarifying something that we've done since. And so I think the first thing I wanna do um, before we go, I, instead of in the past, if you remember, right, we've gone section by section and discussed them. But since the revisions to all these other sections really depend on what's happening here in section five, it makes more sense to me um, to talk first about this section five. We've had two weeks since our last meeting to sort of think about this idea, let it percolate. I'm sure you spend 
most of your waking hours thinking about this and what we might do with it. Um, and so I wanna start by just talking about um, whether we feel based on what you read, uh, that idea would look like actualized in a process and based on sort of just the time you've had to think about this, um, what your thoughts are generally about statements of interest before we get into necessarily all the details. So having seen it written out, having thought about it a little bit more, um, are we still feeling like this is a reasonable thing for us to move forward? And the reason I ask that is I don't want us to get too bogged down in little details if we're not at least all still sort of interested in pursuing this as an option. So, thoughts? No thoughts. Okay. So then, let's go. I'm going to take the, the lack of thoughts as agreement to move forward. Um, so let's actually look at the process that I wrote out. Um, and so this is draft. And so my expectation is this provides some fodder for discussion and some initial draft language that if we do want to move forward, um, we could we could edit um, to adopt. And so the idea is that after OCA declares that the pool is sufficient and adopts selection guidance, the OCA chair would contact each individual as the applicant pool to solicit a statement of interest. Um, and that the statement of interest shall include the adopted selection guidance. This is not all that dissimilar from what would happen now in that right now the OCA chair, uh, after we adopt selection guidance and interview questions reaches out to each applicant. Um, my, my policy has been to again, remind them that they are, had signed up to interview in case they'd forgotten, to share with them the selection guidance and the interview questions, and also to remind them um, about the format of the interviews. And so in this essentially, uh, that email that I've already been doing would, uh, also include this uh, solicitation of a statement of interest. Now, we had some discussion last time we met about uh, whether or not this committee or the committee would spend time discussing what should be in the statement of interest or the details about it um, each time, or whether they would just sort of be a standard template statement of interest um, that's used every time. And so I put two different options in here. One is sort of a standard SOI that every interview, um, this is what the SOI looks like. So the content that applicants write in would, would obviously be different, but what's being asked and all the standards around it would be the same. And then I also put one where OCA would uh, decide the format length and desired content of the SOIs. And so that reflects sort of the first conversation we had and where there was some concern that if OCA had to uh, develop a different SOI template or, or request every time that that would take up more time. So I put both options in there. So the first place for us to talk, I'm going to say would be <clears throat> this section here. So um, let's talk about options A and B and also if there's anything here that you think is missing. Uh, Darcy. Yeah, um, I didn't say anything before, um, not because I agreed, but just because I hadn't gathered my thoughts. But um, uh, I am, um, I feel like uh, the way this is set up that it just goes to the chair um, is not a good situation and that um, I guess I'm interested in knowing um, if this is substituting for our current CAF, which I feel like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, 
I feel like it's unnecessary to do this when we're asking the same questions that are on the CAF. And um, I guess I, my, my main concern is um, when would this be available to the public? And when would it be available to other counselors? When would other counselors get the SOIs? You know, a number of the people on this committee are no longer going to be on OCA very shortly. When will they get access to the SOIs? And when will the public get access to them? Um, that's my main concern. Um, and I have a lot, I have, I, I didn't think we ever even talked about the possibility of not submitting a CAF and doing this instead of a CAF, CAF even the min, most minimal CAF that we're talking about changing to. So, so let me, um, let me address a, a couple of things. Um, so the first thing I'll say is questions about uh, timing. Why don't we put a pause on those because um, as you know from reading through this, that's uh, something that's dealt with later in the, this process that's been written out. And I put a couple options out there. So why don't we save questions about um, when SOIs are released to whom um, for when we get to that part. Uh, the second thing is... Important though, sorry? to me that's, that's a core issue. That is my core issue. No, I'm aware of that. And so we can discuss that when we get to that part. Um, so... Um, with regard to whether or not people submit a CAF, so remember the conversation that we had last time um, was that people would still submit a CAF, but they wouldn't necessarily have to submit a new CAF every time they were interested in applying to a board. And so again, um, this gets at the aspect of if someone submitted a CAF in December for the planning board vacancy that we interviewed for in January, would we require them to submit a brand new CAF for the planning board potential vacancies that we're interviewing for in May. And in that case, do we get two, two CAFs from the same person within the context of six months? Under this process, the answer is no, we wouldn't get two CAFs because we would still have the contact information, the demographic information, and know they're interested. But we would ask for a new SOI, and maybe they could recycle some content. Um, but that actually cut down the number of just CAFs that are adding to our our database. Um, so this wouldn't necessarily mean they don't have to submit a CAF. It just means that if we have on record that they're interested in the body, they don't need to submit um, a new CAF. So that was uh, that, that. That's that's one thing. And then the other thing with regard to you said, um, why does it just go to the chair or that kind of stuff? Um, so I did write, I did put in here chair or designee to reflect the fact that. Um, whichever committee isn't responsible for this might decide, oh, we don't want the chair to do this, we want someone else to do it, someone who has capacity. Um, but I do think it's important that there's a point person who's handling sort of all of this information. Um, and so someone has to contact the applicants to say, hey, you need to submit an SOI. Um, so to me, it makes sense that that's, you know, a single person who's responsible for liaison, liaising with uh, the applicants. Um, the fact that they submit it just back to the chair, I guess you could say they should, they could email it back to town council at, um, but I, I didn't see it as the chair is the only person who has access. It's just the chair is sort of that intermediary, um, much as we do for, for many things. And so uh, I think that's one thing that we could think about, but I, I do think it's useful to have just one person who's the point of contact for the applicants and who works with the applicants um, to, to sort of go back and forth between the committee and the body of applicants. Darcy? So the existing situation is that CIFs automatically go to town councilors. Um, and so this would um, be a step backward from that because of the fact that we wouldn't have a, a firm set of CAFs that were um, because people wouldn't be um, required to even submit a CAF. So um, we wouldn't know who the group of, of appointees were as, as counselors, not just the public, but counselors wouldn't even know. No, that's so, not true. Because people would still be required to submit a CAF and those CAFs 
are still automatically forward to all counselors. So counselors would still have the pool of CAFs under this as they do right now. The only difference would be the SOI. And so um, it would, and, and this would be a little bit more similar to what we did for school committee in that one person would collect all the SOIs and then share them with the counselors and the public. Um, but it would be different in that people would still be required to submit a CIF to express interest and that CIF would still go to um, all of the counselors. Um, so, so yeah, there are still CAFs and they would still automatically go. What? I'm, not sure what this says, if, I'm not sure that's what this says though. Um, if that's true, that would be good. But that, well, that, I mean, that's exactly what's in here. Uh, does anyone else have, and, and can I, can I just ask for, for anyone, if you want to raise your hand to, to use the raise hand button only because it's hard for me to go back and forth between all of the different screens on, um, on the, um, thing. And so I've been looking at the video cameras and now I'm noticing there's a whole bunch of raised hands that I may have been missing because we were doing differently. So I'm just going to go down the line then. I'm going to start with Alyssa. <laughs> We won't. That's why I turned my camera off for a minute so I could bang my head on the desk. I didn't read Evan's memo the same way you read it at all. So I do believe this, this is not going in the direction you're talking about. You're talking. I can't hear you. You're talking about a CAF that's very minimal. And so there, it's not the same. So when we understand your, perhaps this implies that the only person who gets the statement of interest going in the right direction. I always, um, the fact that once we, so your your sound just got very choppy for me. Yeah, yeah she's breaking up badly. Computer. Say it again, George. She's breaking up badly. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if there. It just happened last time. Say I left. Say I left. Document that I left the meeting. Oh. Maybe she's coming back on another device. I hope she's coming back on another device. This happened last time in the sheet and then it, it reconnected in a way that um, we could hear much better. Uh, so while we get clarification on that, why don't we go the next on my list with Sarah Swartz. So um, I will say that I agree with this, and this is the way that I remember it being said, and this is also how I read it, that going to get the CAFs back from two or three years is incredibly labor intensive, especially because they're not all on the same format anymore. So um, we would have people send in a CAF and then I think we all talked about whether or not that CAF would be good for one year or for two years or three years. It's our basic information. Everybody gets it. We also agree that every single person who has sent in a CAF will then be interviewed. So all counselors know who has applied and then we all know that every single one of them is going to be interviewed. From what I understood, the SOI would be a way for us to gather more pertinent information at the time of which we are interviewing people um, that gives us more information about what their current qualifications and interests are uh, better than a CAF where we've kept it, you know, for a year or two years and, and maybe, you know, we're not getting something fresh. So this was a way to keep track of everyone, know that they had interest. We all know who has interest. We all know that every single one of those people, if they want to be interviewed, is going to be interviewed. This is just a way of getting more pertinent information at the time of um, selection of appointment. And so I agree with this. I think this is a great idea and actually gives us more information in a timely manner. 
Okay, thank you. George? I'm um, leaning towards option A. Um, and I wanted to make just a few quick comments about the uh, little wordsmithing, um, if that's appropriate at this point. Um, I took a look at the um, statement for the school committee. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed, and I imagine you did as well, Evan, but one thing I noticed it had in its statement was a sentence, resumes and attachments will not be accepted. I don't know if that's worth putting in here or whether that raises a whole other set of issues, but my understanding was that um, we were not going to uh, seek that sort of thing. And so I wondered if a statement to that effect would be appropriate added to what you have here. That was my first observation. Right. Um, can, can you just repeat that? Sorry. Resumes. It's a, the sentence in the uh, school committee SOI it says resumes and attachments will not be accepted. And if that sentence were inserted at some point, um, wherever it's appropriate, maybe at the end, um, I would suggest that uh, as a consideration. Um, since I don't think we want them, and this basically says even if you send them, we won't look at them. So right. people pull that, I think. Um, and uh, this is a very small point. I would, I would delete at a minimum, and I would just, <clears throat> again, what the school committee does, and this is a, a matter of, of just style and choice, but um, it just says the, uh, the SOI, um, how do they put it? Um, it should, the SOI should address the reasons why the candidate wishes to serve on the board or committee and the candidate's qualifications and experience. My suggestion is a small one, just something like that is better and just delete at a minimum. Okay. <clears throat> That's just a suggestion. Um, and other than that, um, I, those are the, the, I th the other thing they do is they just say one page. And again, this is a very small point and may not be worth our time or trouble, but um, what you have here is perfectly clear. Um, it's just two sentences. And um, if you wanted to make it shorter, you could just say SOI shall not exceed a single page, eight and a half by 11, 12 point font. That's what they do. Um, but that's, you know, you may prefer what you have and that's fine, it's just shorter. The, the one thing I'll say is the only, the only reason uh, I, I put a word instead of a page length is I always feel like, um, and this perhaps comes from a very long time of teaching, um, is when you do a page length, the question is, how big are the margins? How, mm -hmm. how uh, single space versus, so one person who uses one inch, one inch, one inch double space has that much information. Someone who does 0.5 margins and single space, mm -hmm. you know, and so to me, it's always easier just to have a word count um, to, yeah. to help keep it a little more uniform. Yeah. Um, okay, so George, I assume your hand is, should be lowered now. Yeah, sorry. Um, Alyssa, are you able to, you can hear us. Um, are we able to hear you? I don't know. So I could hear that. I'm worried it's still a little choppy, but, um, I want to get your, your input in here somehow. Um, okay, so thank you, George. Um, so I guess the, the George offered some comments. I think those are, are reasonable comments. I, I had forgotten about the resume thing, but that's something that we have discussed in this committee before um, and was discussed at the council. So that seems like a reasonable addition and I can certainly wordsmith, um, you know, that, that section here that George mentioned. Um, George has a preference for option A. Um, is that, you know, this is sort of our first choose your own adventure piece of this is option A or option B. Um, so is there, uh, from the other members of the committee, a preference for option A or option B, um, whether or not we have a standard or something that changes? Uh, Sarah. I'm going to say option A right now. Um, and I would also say that I agree with you as an English major. Um, I do think it's smarter to keep it with a word count than rather just say a page. Okay, uh, Alyssa? 
I agree on the word count. And the only ex reason I was considering option B would be as an addendum to the end of option A, right? Trying to keep all our options open, which is that if for some, I, when I was reading this earlier, I was, you know, a couple days ago, I was thinking, well, there might be a circumstance. And then I remembered, well, we only have three bodies we're talking about here. Um, so then I'm wondering if we can feel good about option A in general for all the reasons we already said, but also because it's the selection criteria that make the difference as to what they write in the SOI, as opposed to, see how that sentence says, at a minimum it shall include, Mm -hmm. and it says with the adopted selection guidance. So I think that then just puts the burden on the selection guidance being the current most up-to-date, most tweaked for this particular body at this particular time. Okay. Um, so we have a couple votes for option A um, with some minor words missing changes. I think I mean, my personal opinion is that option A is probably the easier one. Um, already the committee has to debate sufficiency of the pool to proceed, has to develop selection guidance, and also has to develop interview questions. So it seems like having some at least standard initial format um, for the SOI makes sense. And I, and I agree with what um, Alyssa said that to some extent that the heavy lifting of the variation between the SOIs comes from the selection guidance, which is likely to change. Um, and so I made sure to include that in there. Any other thoughts on A versus B? Okay, so I'm hearing more of a preference for A and so I'm going to highlight that just for now. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so I remember. Um, so another, another question, and, and this was something that was just very briefly touched on in um, our conversation, um, but was really something that I thought of after uh, would be more significant was uh, deadline. So I, I have here, which I think is, is somewhat agreeable, uh, the OCA chair or designee shall establish a deadline for submission of SOIs from applicants that provides sufficient time for the SOIs to be posted as part of the interview special meeting packet at least 48 hours in advance. And so that's the, the latest that things can be published. And so I want to stress that because this isn't the timing discussion just yet. That comes next. The latest that things could be posted would be 48 hours in advance. So then, of course, the question comes, what happens if someone misses the deadline? Um, and so we, we touched on that very briefly last time, um, but I essentially, there, there are two options I put out there, although I'm sure there are infinite options for us. Um, one is essentially an exclusionary deadline that basically says, look, even if you're in the pool, if you don't get your SOI in by this deadline, um, you're, uh, you don't, you're not in the pool anymore, um, which is, is, I think, what the school committee process was, although that, of course, process is a little bit different because there's never a debate on sufficiency of the pool or anything like that. Um, the other one is a non-exclusionary deadline, which basically says, look, we give you a deadline to submit your SOI. If you don't submit it by then, you're still in the pool, you can still be interviewed, but we don't have an SOI for, for you. And, it, and so, you know, we're moving forward without our full information about you. Um, and so perhaps that person is then at a disadvantage, um, which I wrote in there. I don't know if we'd actually want to include that in a public version, but just for our reminder. So um, with regard to this, there obviously has to be a deadline that we say you need to submit your SOI by. Uh, do we want to say that if, if people meet that deadline, if they don't meet that deadline, they're out of the pool, or is it just, we just don't have an SOI for that person? Uh, George. I went back and forth on this. Um, I don't think I have a really strong view, and I'm, I'm certainly open to other thoughts, but I guess uh, rethinking it and listening to you as you go through it, I guess I'm leaning toward the non-exclusionary deadline. Um, it would be nice if people did what we asked, but sometimes they don't, and sometimes they have good reason. Um, we also struggle sometimes to, uh, as you've just experienced, we just experienced people becoming members to the pool at very short notice, um, so uh, and people dropping out. Um, so I guess I would lean uh, somewhat toward the non-exclusionary. Okay. 
Alyssa. I'm going to vote for exclusionary because I don't want someone who's especially glib to just be able to show up and perform because they couldn't be bothered to fill out the thing. I, I think as long as we give people really clear deadlines as to when it is, just like we did with school committee, and we said you will have it in by this time or you will not be considered, I think that's a perfectly reasonable deadline to hold people to. If they can't follow that simple direction combined with showing up at the interview when they're told to, that I don't think they need to be a member of this body. They need to be able to when Christine Breaststrup reaches out to them and says, can you serve on this panel or not? Tell me by four o'clock today. They need to be able to respond to that. And we're going to give them a lot more notice than just a couple of hours. So I feel it's important to be exclusionary because it definitely does put people at different levels if they haven't all turned in a form. When we talk about timing, and I understand that you wrote it here from a legal standpoint to have the 48 hours, so that at minimum you would want to have it be part of the posting. I would be happy to talk more as we talk about timing about insisting that it be a longer period of time prior to the meeting. Although I certainly do understand what we just went through with our pool changing up until the last minute. I also believed at the time we were doing that, that that would be no longer true once we went with the statement of interest process. Okay, Sarah. I agree with Alyssa for all of the reasons that she just stated. Um, I think that there that should be, it levels the playing field. So it does make sure that um, everyone is being conscientious, everyone is following the same rules and that it doesn't, it, it definitely could um, be in favor to someone who maybe doesn't meet deadlines, but definitely has a gift of the gab. And I, I just think that you need to you need to keep everything the same for everyone. Okay, so we have uh, one preference for option B, two for option A. Uh, Darcy, what do you think? I I I uh, I need to have my other questions answered about all of this whole process before I weigh in on any details. Why? I may ask. Because I, I can't support the process unless I understand what the timing of um, getting information out to members of the council and members of the public. Right. Well, that's the next question. But let's, let's say that under your ideal situation it, with timing, if you had to consider this question, which would you have a preference for? Well, it seems like the whole purpose of, of doing this is that we think that for some reason, people are going to fill this out where they didn't fill out their CAFs. And if they don't fill this out, then what are we gaining by having this process? Um, so, um, and we're setting this up like it's, special for our three special committees, um, what, what would we have if we didn't have a CAF and we didn't have an SOI? We wouldn't have anything. Right. So yes, I'm agreeing with, agreeing with the women. Okay. Um, my, my personal thought is, is I sort of put both these options on here without necessarily um, feeling wedded to one or the other. Um, so I was actually really looking forward to hearing the committee discuss these um, uh, and the benefit of being chair, of being able to go last is being able to hear um, from my colleagues. And I think I actually probably came in with a slight bias towards option B, um, but I think that there were some really good points made about option A, um, both the point of, if you, if you can't submit your SOI in time, I, these are pretty important bodies, right? Um, and, and I think also the point that Darcy just made of this is functioning uh, as the content section of the CAF and they don't submit it. We, you know, it's, a, it's almost like not having the information. So um, 
I think I've been swayed more towards option A, and so that seemed to be where the majority of the committee was. So I am going to just highlight that one to indicate that. Um, okay, and so this last one is the timing question. So I thought of a, a different options to do this, and sort of these are the, the two um, the the two ones, which is um, so right now. Um, and let me, let me preface it saying this way. These are sort of the two polar options. I understand there's sort of gradations in between. Um, to me, it seemed easier to give two options that we can alter than say, here's 14 different options. Um, and so I'm going to give the two polar options, but also recognizing that both options A and B can be modified. Um, so one is sort of a bundled posting, which is that all of the applicants SOIs roll in. Once we have all of the SOIs of the pool, they all get posted at once at the same time, um, 48 hours in advance of the meeting, or you could say longer. I mean, to some extent that would depend on the deadline um, and that they would be both added to the meeting packet, but then also attached to the public meeting posting so they'd have access um, by the public. And so, um, this is sort of similar to what we did for school committee in that they were all submitted by the same deadline. Um, we don't know when certain ones came in, but we received all of them at once and then they were also available to the public once they were available to us. Um, obviously that was not 48 hours in advance of the meeting, that was a week or a week and a half or whatever. Um, so again, that, that timing can be changed. Um, but the idea being that all of them are posted at once. And then the other idea being that they are posted to the meeting packet and the public posting as they come in. And so essentially is, uh, this gets back to, I think what Dar and Darcy was hinting at earlier, which is essentially as soon as it's available um, to the chair, it's immediately available to the counselors and to the public. Uh, so again, two polar options. Um, and so both of these, I can see different ways that they can modify to be say, to say different things. Um, but I wanted to put the two extreme options out there um, with the expectation that we'll likely land somewhere sort of in the middle. Um, so, floor is open. I see Alyssa. Sorry about that. Of course you do. Um, I would do A, but with a week in advance of the meeting. However, we want to define, you know, calculation of time in the charter, but <laughs> I mean, I mean seven days and I could be persuaded to go longer. It's just that it gets harder and harder for the person who's arranging all of this to stagger all these dates, right? We got the interview date, then you back up from that, then you back up from that. But I would say a week in advance and I would say bundled. And again, I'm reflecting to the people who are cleverer at, um, writing statements than others. If I know they're going to go up individually, then I'm going to wait and read everybody else's so that I can write a better one. Okay, so we have one preference for option A, but with one week instead of 48 hours in advance. Uh, Sarah. I'm going to say option A, um, and I'm fine with changing it to up to a week before. And again, as, as someone who was an English major, that's what I have my small degree in, um, I would want any writing sample that I did to be released at the same time as everyone else's just because of um, being able to read other people's definitely would be an advantage. I uh, see George. I too support option A. I guess I'd like a little more thought um, and I, I, on the length of time. Um, I'm not bothered by 48 hours, um, but I'm, I, again, I'm not wedded to it either. Um, I think going more than a week creates a whole, I'm just also worried about the, the, whoever it is who has to arrange all this. Um, could someone speak a little bit about why a week is preferable to say what we have here, which is 48 hours? I don't, this is just my thick head, but I don't see, um, I kind of like 48 hours, but uh, otherwise option A bundled makes sense to me. Alyssa, your preference was, was for a week. Did you wanna take that? 
Yes, thank you. I think a week speaks to a number of different issues and, I, and I'm hoping Darcy supports that um, and is that I see, I understand the part about, you know, anything we do to make things more complicated, as I indicated, if we'd made it two weeks, that would have been even more trouble to try and get the timeline right on these. And because, of course, they don't all happen at the nice, convenient times of year, they happen at completely random times of year, as we have experienced. What I would argue and always argue, and George, you've heard me say this at town council meetings, it is completely unacceptable that elected officials have 48 hours to consider the material before their meeting. They need it further ahead of time. And Athena and everyone else has worked, and all levels have worked really hard to make the last minute be sooner so that stuff starts coming to us on Wednesdays frequently now, instead of Fridays for Monday. And it's just so important that we have some time to think about these things, to remind ourselves of our process, et cetera. And, you know, in many cases, we're only going to have two statements of interest, take 10 minutes to read it, right? But what if we do have seven? What if we do have 10? I just want everyone to have longer than 48 hours. And I feel like the week does not put you in a position of everyone feeling like they have to lobby for their favorite candidates by writing us letters. Okay. So we have, that sounds like a greater preference for, uh, oh, sorry, George, I didn't see your hand up here. Let's see what we're doing here. George, is that hand? Sorry. Active? Sorry. So no. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm saying it seems like there's a slightly greater preference for A, some debate over the length of time. Uh, Darcy. Um, what? Uh, could you explain option B? Um, she'll add applicants SRY to the meeting packet uh, and public posting as they come in. How would that work? So the moment that the chair or the designee, whoever is in charge of being uh, the point of contact between the committee and the applicants, um, as soon as they receive the SOI um, from the applicants, whether that's three weeks in advance of the interview, two weeks, it doesn't matter. The moment they receive that SOI, it's added to the packet and added to the posting. So it is Im immediately available to um, both public and counselors uh, the moment it's received. But um, so that a meeting packet would be created that was three weeks in advance of a meeting. I've never seen such a thing. And, and what's the public posting? Like when you post a meeting? So you would be posting the SOI? So one of the conversations we've had here, right, is about what's what's released to the public um, from the CAF. And so one of the things that this is intended to help us uh, navigate is find a, a, a compromise solution between uh, whether CAFs are public records and personnel records, right? And so the idea being that the SOIs would be public. Um, and of course, you've had conversations on this committee about what does that mean for, an S for something to be public? Does that just mean that it's subject to a public records request? Does that mean that it's easily available to the public um, I tried to go with the most public way I could think doing this, which is that the SOIs themselves would be part of the public meeting posting um, uh, attached to it so that any member of the public that wants to see who applied and what the qualifications are could go to the meeting posting and find the documents and read them. Um, now, of course, that's... that's so the meeting posted way in advance of what it would normally be posted. So the meeting would be, I mean, our process has been, I have had these meetings posted the moment I can confirm an interview date. Um, so uh, with the planning board meeting, that, that, those interviews, because, I, because there were only three people, and so it was easier to find a, a common date that everyone could uh, contribute to. Uh, if you remember, those interviews happened on January 22nd, I think. Um, 
and they were posted about three, that, that meeting was posted about three weeks in advance because I was able to confirm the date very quickly. Uh, the ZBA interviews, it took a little bit longer. I think they were, that interview was posted maybe a week and a half, two weeks in advance um, because it just took longer. But the, my, pro, my, my process, and maybe this is something I need to pass on, has been um, to post the meeting the moment I can confirm the date for it. So you're talking about the meeting in which the interviews will occur? Yeah. So um, we, the, it seems like the, um, I mean, that's, I guess, one option, but uh, as we saw in Northampton, they just had it posted in a link in the next meeting of OCA or CRC or who, whoever is going to be doing this. Um, so it would just be an agenda item with a link in that next meeting. Um, seemed like it'd be a little bit easier for people to find. Um, you don't think well, but so? To get the agenda, they'd have to go to the meeting posting. This would actually be one less click because what you're describing, they'd have to go to the meeting posting, click on the agenda, and then click on the link within the agenda. This, they'd go to the meeting posting and they'd all be right there. Okay. So with the, right. I think this would actually, this would be one fewer click for the public. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think that you, um, we'll be surprised to know that I favor B. Uh, or if we did A, if we had two weeks instead of one week, that would um, also be a good thing. Because I'm, I'm assuming that, it, that, that the rolling posting might end up being a couple weeks in advance, which I, as you heard at the last, our last meeting, that's what I was suggesting would be better than 48 hours. Um, um, so I, I, I'm obviously, I'm open. I think for E, I think to me, I, you know, from the perspective of the person who's been that intermediary, the bundle posting is probably easier because it's just less to, to keep up with. And like if someone's thing comes in on a Sunday and I don't get to it to a Tuesday, but then they have someone submits on Tuesday and I get to it right away, is there an unfair matter? Um, one thing I want to I want to throw out there that's applicable to both options A and B, as long as we're talking about that, is so using literally the example that we had for um, the um, ZBA. God, I couldn't think of it. Uh, the the ZBA interviews we just did. So we did those ZBA interviews on April sixteenth. Um, so if we had forty eight the forty eight hours, that means that and uh, that means that they'd all need to be posted by April 14th. If we did a week, they'd all have needed to be posted by April 9th. If we did two weeks, they'd all need to be posted by April 2nd. So just starting to conceptualize what that looks like. So one potential wrinkle that I think we would need to iron out with this is, um, so I had one applicant who joined the pool on April 4th, and I had another applicant who joined the pool on April 10th. So if we're saying that they need, if, if the deadline is the same as a posting, so a week or two week, if we're saying that they needed to um, come in, if they need, if they're excluded from the pool for going with this option A that we highlighted, um, if they don't get an SOI, I think we do have to keep in mind that further in advance we push that SOI deadline, um, the, the more we push the deadline to when someone can enter the pool. And so if we started from that, everyone knows this, it might not make a big difference. But I do think it's worth recognizing that um, if we had put that a week in advance, there was one person who was in the ZBA pool who might not have otherwise been in it. If we had put it two weeks in advance, there's two people who were in the ZBA pool who might not have otherwise been in it because they joined the pool late and they would have joined after the deadline to submit that so I passed. <clears throat> So I just want to make sure that we're aware of, of, of that. Uh, George, your hand is up. And I think, Evan, that you have uh, articulated much better than I could um, my concern. Um, I hear Alyssa, and uh, she makes, as always, a very good point about you know trying to uh, help us as elected officials um, do our own jobs. 
And in the end, perhaps the committee will agree with that. But I guess on my end, I'm concerned about um, making this a process that um, casts the net as wide as possible. Um, and maybe in the end, there's just no way this can work. But as you point out, at least two candidates would not have uh, survived simply because of the process if we pushed it out by a week um, and two weeks. So. Uh, again, that's my concern. I guess I'd just like to hear from the rest of the committee um, whether in the end the desire to have more time to review documents, which is perfectly understandable in their mind, outweighs um, my desire to um, keep this process, uh, have the net as wide as possible. And also given the challenge we face, I think, and Alyssa can certainly speak to this uh, one way or the other, but um, the challenge we face in getting people to serve on CPA planning board, um, we found this is not easy. Um, and people sometimes make decisions, you know, people become available at the last minute, blah, blah, blah. Um, I guess I'm also worried about that. Um, but maybe that's just life. Uh, thoughts in response to, to George's concern and, and the potential issue I brought in about uh, the more we move the deadline forward, the more we have a hard uh, cutoff uh, for when people can join the pool. Uh, Sarah, then Darcy. So I think that while I understand that we want to have, you know, the biggest pool that we possibly can, I also feel like, you know, we, maybe someone would be able to convince someone who's fantastic, you know, seven hours before the meeting. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think if these become hard and fast rules, people will start recruiting earlier. And I think that um, counselors really do need to do due diligence and have some time. So I'm gonna sort of stand firm on the week. Uh, Darcy. I guess I don't see why we wouldn't be able to add to our posting if someone came in late. I mean, if we have, if we have a deadline for when people, you know, the last day when they can, uh, can apply, which is different <clears throat> from the date of posting, um, that would not offend me to, to add people. I understand that, you know, the original posting might be what people looked at first and someone might feel like that was unfair. But if they wanted to be added, <laughs> then they might have to uh, um, be added late. So you're saying that we should be, that even if we say SOIs are due one, two, one, two weeks in advance, and that's sort of the deadline for SOIs, if someone wants to join the pool a week in advance, um, we say, sure, you can still join. You have to get us or your SOI as soon as possible. And we would just add it in. Yes. Okay. Just, just I want to make sure. I want to make sure I'm understanding. Uh, let's see, uh, Alyssa. But that flies in the face of what we just decided about exclusionary deadlines. The deadline is the deadline. It's got it's not got separate parts because of the statement of interest. The deadline is you don't get considered if you don't get your statement of interest in, which is basically a week plus a day ahead of the interviews. And I say a week plus a day because this is really not a difficult task to put this together and staff should normally be available to do it, but you know, we're in a difficult time if the chair has to do it again, not a horrible burden because we've all had, had things posted. But we already said we do not have a rolling deadline. Therefore, there's no rolling deadline for statement of interest. They are all going to get uploaded to the posting just like other things we've done in the past where we have had for example, the um, town manager's appointments, we've had our appointments added to the posting, and it's all going to be, you know, a week and a day, basically, in advance of the interview. I don't understand why you would let people join the pool late when we already had that conversation. Uh, we have 
George, your hand was up. Now I don't see it. Are you? Uh, well, it, yeah, again, it's the difficulty of this format, but uh, my mind's going back and forth. Um, again, we do have the exclusionary deadline and um, I'm, I'm tempted by Darcy's suggestion um, because again, from my perspective, it, it keeps the, the window open as long as possible. Um, but then you run into the problem that Alyssa points out, which is now essentially the exclusionary deadline really doesn't really become exclusionary because people can, you know, uh, enter into it, um, you know, a few days before and submit an SOI, I assume. Um, so I guess my up and down hand reflects my up and down mind. So I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Darcy, I see your hand up. I guess I'm just, I was just saying that if we adopted the rolling posting mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, and there were SOIs that were coming in, um, you know, three weeks in advance and they were showing up <clears throat> on the posting, um, then I'm not sure. uh, if, if someone, were to if someone were to be added after at any point they could be added after the you know they they'd be showing up in a rolling basis um to the public and to other counselors and so on um but they wouldn't we wouldn't accept them after a certain point whenever that so we'd still have some hard deadline that would be an exclusionary deadline, but. Right, so they would start coming in. <clears throat> yep. And then, but at some point they would stop. So, so I, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding your, your position. So theoretically, you would say you have a deadline 48 hours in advance is when you have to get your thing in. And then as they come in, we just post them. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, I see Sarah's hand up. So I, I, maybe it's just that I'm not wrapping my mind around this correctly. I mean, I guess I'm seeing that what we're saying is that if we have a rolling <laughs> deadline, then at least all of them are published at the same time, but that goes completely against what we were trying to say about having everyone get everything in at the same time, which would lead to an even playing field. So I still can't go there. I'm still going to say a week before same rules for everyone and giving counselors a chance to digest the information. Okay, so, so we're looking for, so, so I'm hearing a couple themes here. Um, so we're looking for um, giving counselors um, enough time to be able to read the material. I mean, I think as Alyssa said, it's, it's one thing if there are two applicants, if there are 10 applicants, 10 pages of SOIs, um, you might not wanna read that 48 hours in advance. You might want a little bit more time. Uh, we're hearing, uh, especially from George, that we wanna make sure that we're not, um, taking too many actions that are going to um, constrain the pool or, or make it small. We want to make sure that we're constantly making sure that as many people who are interested in serving in our town government can serve in town government. And we don't want to be uh, turning away um, warm bodies that, uh, that, that want to serve. Um, and we're also hearing uh, that we want to make sure uh, that everyone who's applying has sort of a level playing field. And there's some concern of, um, you know, we want to make sure that one savvy person won't just submit it right before the deadline so that they can, they can read everyone else's and get ideas and, and, um, and put in. So we're hearing, uh, I think probably, uh, enough time for counselors to read, uh, a, a process that allows for as many people as possible to participate and a level playing field for all applicants, which I think are prob are hopefully all things that we can all agree on as, as values and principles. So how to actually actualize those, I think is the, the, the harder point of discussion. Uh, Darcy, I see your hand up. Is that residual or is that current? That's residual. 
Okay. Um, so this is a hard, I think this is a, this, I knew this would be the hardest part of the process to iron out and I think it, it remains. Um, and so what I'm hearing is Darcy has a preference for option B. Um, Alyssa and Sarah have a preference for option A with a one week instead of 48 hours. And George has a preference for option A with perhaps a 48 hours or, or something less than a week. It, am I characterizing people's positions accurately? Can I mischaracterize anyone? No. Okay. Um, so I think then I'll add my input on this. Um, so speaking again as the person who has taken on sort of the responsibility of being the point of contact between applicants um, and thinking about how to do all this, I would probably be more aligned with Alyssa and Sarah. Um, and I think the reason for this is, is uh, the reasons are one, um, I think that it's easier from the perspective of managing all of this um, to be able to just as an SOI comes in, you know, add it to a folder, add it to a folder, add it to a folder, and then just post them sort of a bulk posting. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, if, if I had to, um, post things to the packet or, or send things as they came in. Um, that could be a lot of just, okay, remember to do this, remember to do this. Um, also, I can add them to the packet, but staff has to add them to the meeting posting. Um, I can only imagine Athena is sitting there thinking about the constant email she'd be getting of, oh, and add this one. And then two minutes later, oh, another one came in, add this one, um, as opposed to just here is all of the ones you have to add and it's sort of one attachment. And so I think from an efficiency standpoint, um, I think that carrying that out would be easier. I, I also have some the same concerns that I think Alyssa and Sarah have about level playing field and about people being able to read others before they write their own. Um, but I think looking at it strictly from sort of an operational standpoint, um, that the bundled posting is probably the easiest one um, because there's just, ooh, I'm just knocking my coffee over. Uh, there's just less moving pieces, right? It's just you, you take all of them that you've received and then you decide when to put them in. Um, from an operational standpoint, the 48 hours is the easiest, but I think that I'm hearing um, Alyssa uh, very clearly on the fact that um, 48 hours is not a whole lot of time if you have, you know, other things to do. Um, and certainly, like I said, my, the week that we did the ZBA interviews, and I keep doing this and scheduling these interviews during my terrible weeks, um, you know, I... I I honestly wouldn't have had time on that Wednesday or Thursday to read through seven statements of interest. Um, I, I was back to back every single one of those days between my full-time job and this full-time job. And so um, having more time, I think would have been good. And, and I think that it also just would have given me more time to, to ponder in advance. Um, and so as, as much as I am wary about pushing that deadline out because there are complications, like what if someone tries to, during the pool late. Um, sometimes some of these logistics don't fall into place until later than you hope. Certainly that was true with ZBA. Um, I, think, I think a week is reasonable. I would be wary about going beyond a week. I think two weeks um, starts to get a little tricky. Um, so I think I'm probably a little bit more in camp uh, Alyssa, Sarah on this. Um, again, coming at this from the perspective of if I had to do what I did for planning board and for ZBA um, with this process, you know, which would be the best way to go about doing it. Um, so why don't we pause that discussion for now? I think we've probably beat that horse, um, but I am going to just highlight this and write one week, not because we've made a decision, but that's just be because I think that's where, the majority of the committee currently lies. Um, I want to go through and just run through some of the other changes that were made to these other sections because I think we've discussed the section five quite a bit um, and then we're gonna we're gonna circle back. So hopefully you can still see my screen. Um, so section two 
Um, I did two things differently. Uh, I changed one is to note that CAS should be kept on file for three years. Right now we say two years. Uh, we've, I think, recognized that sort of an arbitrary number. And since most terms are three years, I'm not quite sure why two years would be how long we keep them on file. And so I changed it from two to three. Um, and I basically said that if you already submitted a CAF for that body within the past three years, you don't need to resubmit a CAF, which is sort of what we're trying to get at here, right? Not making people resubmit every time they're interested if we already have on file that they're interested in this body. Um, so this would comply with that process. And um, uh, I got rid of the member seeking reappointment must also submit a new CAF um, because again, the whole idea is if they have a non-file CAF in the past few years, they don't need to resubmit. And then the second thing um, I put on this actually has nothing to do with what we um, have been talking about in this, but it's something that I've just recognized as something that should be added having enacted this process twice, which is um, we said that the chair shall reach out to all applicants to confirm receipt of their CAF, um, which is something I've been doing when someone submits a CAF. I say, you know, thank you for submitting your CAF. But then usually I immediately get a question back that says, okay, so when should I expect to interview? What's going on with this? And so I think that if we're going to require um, the OCA chair, or I should put chair or designee, um, to reach out and confirm the receipt of the CAF, uh, we should let them know what the status is. So if someone submitted a CAF for the ZBA today, it would make sense for me to say, thank you for submitting this, you know, just to let you know, we just recommended appointments to the ZBA, so it might be a while until there's a vacancy, um, just so they're not wondering a week later, how come they haven't called me? Uh, so, uh, Questions, comments on the revisions to this? I see a hand from Darcy. Yeah, I think um, I asked a question earlier and um, uh, because I was concerned that we were saying, and it is in the directions to filling out the CAS that, that people are not required to file a CAF if they've filed one in the last three years. And so we won't have a, uh, a finite group of people that we know has applied for, um, for this position. Didn't, I mean, I, did I miss here at the beginning of this meeting that, that uh, it was said that every person that applies for a position will need to reapply, at least filling out the minimal CAF that you're talking about? No, the, the idea of this being that once someone expresses that an interest in a body, they don't necessarily need to be continuously resubmitting a new CAF to express their interest because they're already in our pool of people who have expressed interest. And so if you think about this, um, for, for example, um, it, there are people who apply to be on the planning board um, uh, when we did appointments to the planning board in last spring, spring 2019. Um, those people are still in our pool of people who have expressed interest. So uh, last week when I reached out to everyone for whom we have a CAF on file, I reached out to those people. Now, several of them responded and they said, oh, no, I'm not interested anymore, but they were still in our pool. And so essentially it would just do that same thing. It would just not force those people to resubmit a CAF. So we're already collecting, I mean, part of the process and part of what we've done these past three times now has been to go back and look at the pool of CAFs that we have over the past, we've been doing two years, and reach out to everyone who submitted and ask if they're still interested. Um, that wouldn't change. The only thing that would change is it would say, look, if we already have on file that you're interested in the planning board, you don't have to resubmit a new CA. You have to tell us you're interested in the planning board because we already know, we already have that on file and we're already going to be reaching out to you to say, hey, you, you said you're interested, are you still interested? Um, so the, this doesn't change what we're doing now, except it doesn't require someone to be continuously resubmitting a CAF. And I think the idea behind this, this is it simplifies this. So again, if someone submitted a CAF to the planning board in December, we already have a CAF on file for them. It doesn't force them to now submit another CAF 
in April when they just have one in December because we already know they're interested in planning board and I'm already going to be reaching out to them to say, You're, are you still interested? Uh, George, I see your hand up. Just a quick question about two years versus three. Um, I hear your point about the terms being three years, so that, that uh, makes sense. Um, and maybe this is a, a, not a real serious concern, but I believe the uh, it's still two years for um, other committees, right? For the for manager appointed bodies that CAFs are kept for two years. Is that, is that correct, or am I mistaken about that? I don't know. Um, um, again, the only concern would be that we have one rule and and the other committees have another rule, and uh, I just would prefer it be consistent. But um, that's the only question I had about two versus three. Uh, your listeners, I'm not sure how long the town manager keeps applications on file. Um, for me personally, I'm actually, uh, we have uh, diverged so dramatically from what the town manager does in so many different ways um, that at, at this point, uh, I was more concerned with consistency a year ago. Um, but okay. now that the town manager, I mean, considering they do, we do public interviews, uh, they're really, I mean, the, the process is so different that I'm not so sure, um, for me personally, that, that how much we are consistent with what the town manager does matters. I guess I was thinking about staff, but again, it may just be a, this is a minor, minor point. In other words, they have to be aware that for, for council, it's three years, for town, it's two. Yeah. You, you, you know, I, and here's, here's why I don't think that matters. When I've been collecting CAFs, essentially I sent an email to Angela that says, can you send me all CAFs from right. this date on? And so she just does that. So I'm not saying, I would hope that someone wouldn't just go, Angela, send me a ZBA CAFs, because she'd have to be like, well, which ones? I always say, I always take whatever date the posting was, subtract two years and say from this date to current. And so she just queries that. And so... Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, we have quite a few hands up. Uh, Sarah. So I'm going to agree with Evan in the fact that um, now town council's appointments are so incredibly different, right, than town managers that we simply need to be consistent. Town council seems to needs to just be consistent with our own rules. Um, about appointments. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I believe that Oka said once we changed um, the form for town council appointments, that those CAFs, are, I believe, are going to the town council appointing authorities. Is that correct? That now, like Evan, if you're, they're going right to you. So um, in another, like, two years, it won't matter because it'll be town council that will have the record of all the CAFs. It, we, I, am I correct in thinking that because of how they're flowing, you won't, town council won't council itself will have its own pool. We'll, we'll, we're the keepers now of the uh, people who applied for our appointments, correct? Yeah, so I mean, they, I, they still go into a database, and so they're still queryable um, by staff if we ask, but, but uh, you know, um, they are all coming to us, right? And right. so we, every counselor has every CAF that has been submitted since October in their email. Whether those are easy, so for me personally, whenever I have a, a folder in my email that just says CAFs, and whenever I get a CAF, I just add it to that folder. So at any point in time, if you want to know who's applied to any of these committees, I can go to that folder. I don't, I don't know how other people are keeping track of them, and maybe some, maybe you're not because it's not necessarily a priority because you don't have to reach out to them, right? But, but yeah, I think what you're saying is is true that um, in theory, I don't. Uh, the only reason I, I need staff right now at this point to give me CAFs. Um, is because there are, if we're going back two years or three years, there's CAF before those are coming, right? But in theory, right, three years from that, I think it was October 23rd that the council voted, um, the counselors, assuming they're still the same counselors, um, 
will will have all those CAS. So so yeah, I think there's there's multiple aspects. So Evan, maybe could we write into the process that whoever is the designee or the, I'm just going to say designee or chair needs to compile that list, right? And then it could be handed down. Either that or find some way we can write down right now how town council itself keeps its own database. I, I think that that would be right. smart because, you know, even though that way we have it ready and it's part of our separate process. That's, oh, wow. I guess, is. No, I got you. Uh, Darcy, your hand is up. I would agree with Sarah um, on, on that suggestion that there needs to be uh, like a running spreadsheet of people who've applied and um, their current status. I still think that, you know, the point of our minimizing the CAF form was so that it would be easy for people to fill out. And I, I, I think that everybody who applies, who wants to be considered to be in the pool, needs to fill out a CAF. And um, I think that counselors will want that to be the case because we automatically get CAFs that will be much easier for us to see who's in the current pool. And um, so I, I don't understand why, if we went through the process of minimizing the form, why we wouldn't then require people to fill it out. And there's also the issue of people constantly changing addresses, changing their contact information. We need to have the most updated information on these people even if they applied last year they might have a different address or a different phone number or a different email address or whatever so um i you know i feel like there's no um, um advantage to not having them all fill out their cafs especially since they won't have to spend any time on it at all. So I just, so to make sure I'm clear where you're at. So Jane Smith applied for the planning board when we appointed in last spring. So they submitted one in February 19. They applied again and submitted one in December 2019 when we, when we appointed. And so your argument would be, even though we already have CAFs on the Jane Smith, from February 2019 and December 2019, if they want to apply this time, we are asking for now another CAF. Yes, it will take them even five if no minutes. Contact, even if no information has changed. No, but we need it because we need, we need the pool of who's applying this time for this position. Well, we have the pool when the chair, I mean, the pro I mean, this is again, not similar to what we've been doing. We have the pool when the chair reaches out to every person for whom we have a CAF on file. Right, um, but it's automatic. it's automatic that it would automatically go to the town council members. So would, would the idea be, <coughs> I'm trying to think, so, let, so again, so Jane Smith has a CAF on file from December, 2019. I email Jane Smith and say, hey, are you still interested in planning board? She says, yes. And I said, okay, can you submit a new CAF to let us know? Is that what you're thinking? Because we don't, we only uh, have one on you from December, 2019. So submit a new one. Yeah, if she hasn't already, you know, heard about it and done it on her own. Uh-oh, well, this is. So, every, so, I, so, I'm just, so I'm just trying to think. So I contacted a number of people last week who had CAFs on file with us over the past three years. And so I would say to each of them, are you still interested? And if you are, please submit a new CAF to let us know that you're interested. Yes. Okay. Um, Sarah, is this a, this hand's been up for a while. Is it residual or is it new? It's new. Okay, great. So we'll go to you and then Alyssa. Okay, so this is how I understand our process, which is we have, um, it's in a sort of, we, 
we post that there are openings for a committee and they're posted and we're giving a date but we also have people who you know are are going to go online they're going to see things that they're interested in and so they're going to just submit a caf town council gets that caf and it's automatically released to all town councilors if someone had um, the interest in knowing what a running pool is they could make their own spreadsheet or they could write down names as they come in and keep it in a notebook we have the people's basic information submitted to us and every single one of us gets it. And then we're also asking a chair or a designee also to keep a database for us, just in case we lose our notebook. We have the constant base of who is applying for what with their basic information. If we wanted to, we could also put a little thing on the CAF saying, these CAFs are good for three years. Um, if you have a change in address or phone number, you need to, uh, contact and I would put a town council contact right so the onus is on people who applied to let town council know within that three years if they've moved to Oregon or what their new phone number is if it's unlisted you get blah 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 blah, blah. but the thing the thing that we're changing we're trying to make this more streamlined so we have one CAF that the designee does not have to sweat. They've, they've got it, we have it, it's simpler. Then while we're looking for more uh, detailed information about what someone's interest and their qualifications are right now, we are asking for an SOI. So we have the best of both worlds. We don't have to go searching for their basic information. We got it, we know who's interested. And then instead of having to just give us the blah, 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 yada, yada address thing, which doesn't help us, every single time we are asking for a new SOI, which gives us the pertinent information that we care about. So I don't see where we're missing any steps. This is, I, so, one CAF, three years, if you want to add something about letting us know if your, your address or your phone number changes, I think that covers everything. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I'm glad this is being recorded because I want to transcribe what you just said for addition to a potential feature report because that was a beautiful walkthrough of every detail. Um, Alyssa, your hand has been up. Agreed. Sarah just covered 90% of what I was going to say. So thank you, Sarah. That was really clear. I think one of the thing would help Evan perhaps is that it when you write the report to be clearer, or frankly, maybe I just skipped over this part because it was already obvious to me, but it's clearly not obvious to everyone. And it won't be obvious to the people on various council committees who haven't been doing this, which is that CAFs come in as was indicated briefly earlier, all year round. So immediately after those ZBA interviews, now we saw this didn't happen, but in theory, one could watch those interviews and be inspired to serve on ZBA and fill out a CAF right then knowing full well that it might not actually be looked at, you know, in any detail for months. And so those CAFs are all there. I mean, starting now, the only reason we had we made people for reappointment do CAFs was because we didn't have statements of interest. CAFs, they have filed at some point. The people who are coming up on planning board for reappointment, they filed a CAF at some point since we have a, you know, hopefully at the end of today's meeting, a streamlined CAF. The important stuff is gonna be in the statement of interest. As Sarah said, Darcy made an excellent point about saying if your contact information changes, Bear in mind, this is the only way we have of reaching you. So send an email, and I would argue, just send it to town council, right? Because all their CAFs are going straight to town council. Might as well send it to all of us. I moved to Oregon, I moved across town, whatever. Send that to all of us. People will forget and they won't necessarily do it. The only other insight I wanted to provide was associated one aspect of the two year versus three year issue. One of the reasons for the two year version, even though committee appointments have always been for one, two, and three years forever that I know of, is that we have transitioned this database of how to keep track of CAFs several times. It's garbage. It's really hard for people to work with. So the least further back we had to go, 
made sense because people were trying to import from different systems. So that was part of the reason. Now that we'll have a simpler system and moving forward, we've learned all learned so much. And we are again, all getting the CAFs like the select board used to. I would argue that three years for basic information, you know, not part of selection, criteria right is is totally reasonable but yes definitely include that part about tell us if your information changes because we have no way to reach you otherwise what we don't want is we don't want someone to have watched those zba interviews be inspired to join zba fill out a caf and then the next time there's a zba announcement fill out another one um they there's a, always a contact person on the vacancy announcement and they can say hey you still have mine right i moved D did you know that that would that should cover all of that yeah i guess there's that's where i need some clarification so i mean I, some might, sometimes i hate debating in hypotheticals but i think sometimes it's useful so running with Alyssa's example if someone submitted a caf for the zba today because they watched the interviews and, and were so inspired and then we had a vacancy for the zba in september would we then contact that person and say if you're still interested you have to submit a new caf even though the caf is only four months old that that's what personally that's what i'm trying to cut down on is that having to constantly submit new cafs if we already have that they're interested yeah i i guess i feel like the value of of making sure that the town councilors and the public know who's in the pool is much more important than our need for uh, efficiency. Well, they would know from the SOIs. Right. Yes, we'll know that by um, one week before the interviews. But if we were getting CAFs, we'd know, the counselors would know before that. Um, well, they, the counselors already know because they have the CAFs already. Well, they don't have the CAFs if the designee has not um, sent, you know, contacted the person yet or whatever. Um, that's, that's a lot of it. You know, I, I guess I'm just, uh, I'd rather, as a counselor, I'd rather get the CAFs directly then um well you are because once someone submits a caf it goes to everyone right but our rules that we're looking at right now say that people don't have to uh, to put in a caf so counselors will never know about the people who um who didn't submit a caf uh, until they they get their SOI a week before the interview. So, you know, there are going to be people that... Um, no, I'm confused. Everyone needs to submit a CAF. It's just they don't need to have to submit a new CAF every time. So counselors would still have that CAF that they're interested in planning board. Right. They, counselors will not know that because only, they won't know that the people are interested until they receive the, CA, the SOI because... Right. Because they won't have submitted a CAF and we don't. Well, they we, will have submitted at some point. Right, but we don't know that they're still interested. Only the designee will find that out. So we don't know who's actually in the pool. And yeah, I mean, so, so, sorry. You know, one thing I think to think about here too is how this all actually plays out in real life. Um, and so to provide an example, um, you will have, you will remember, people, both this happened with planning board and ZBA too, is someone submitted a new CAF and then were not part of the pool because they ended up later on withdrawing. And so who's in the pool is actually a really interesting thing, which I, I don't think I would have fully grasped until we had gone through this, that the pool is incredibly fluid, right? And so, um, to some extent, there were people who submitted CAFs a month before the interviews for ZBA, who then just a couple weeks later said, you know what, I changed my mind and, and withdrew. So the CAFs are, have some utility to an extent, but I think that's where those SOIs are really, really what's communicating who's in the pool, because that's sort of the final 
they've gotten to a point where they're ready to actually, they're writing the full SOI, it's available to everyone. And that's really the pool. And so my worry is that just because you get a CAF in your mailbox a couple of weeks before, you know, that person isn't in the pool until it's ready to go schedule the interviews. And so um, I'm just looking for us to have a, a running list of who is interested, but the SOI is really what's going to define the pool for the council. Um, other other thoughts on this, or should we move to a different section? Uh, Sarah. Okay, so I just want to make this really clear again. When someone is interested in a body, they fill out a CAF, which they know is good for three years. Every single counselor is sent that person's CAF and what they're interested in. If you're interested in knowing who is there and who's applying, write it down in a notebook or write it someplace where you can find it. Um, I think if, you, if we want, but I think we've already said this, that the designee or the chairs of the committees that are making these appointments will also have a spreadsheet or some information available that also, I mean, we're collecting all of them. So these people will have this running list of all the CAFs for every single board back for three years, which in case you've forgotten your notebook or whatever, you could ask that, that chair or designee and you could always get you know, who's filled one out. That's not a mystery, it's not lost, it, it's available. And then when it comes to the time when we're looking to appoint someone, then all counselors, again, which is a, a courtesy, I feel that chairs and designees are doing to counselors to then put them all together again for us and give them back to us in case we've forgotten. You are still getting a pertinent bundle um, at least a week before. None of this is being obscured and then we're getting even more pertinent information. So we do know, we absolutely do know and if we forget, we definitely will know the person to ask. So I, I don't think any of that is lost or hidden. And thank you, for, Sarah, because that also reminded me that a thing that to pass on is the fact that I, I have, before the interviews, collated all of the CAFs and sent them out to um, the full council, which is something that's not actually uh, required, I don't think. Uh, Alyssa, sorry, your hand just went up. So I'm just fine tuning some of the wording under item two and mm -hmm. in terms of that when it says that the, um, the CAF is separate and is automatically, I would say automatically electronically distributed to all counselors immediately so that no one reads this and thinks somebody's supposed to be bundling stuff like was happening for a while in the gap between select board and town council when we did have to put up with that that is no longer the case. And then the OCA chair or designee shall reach out to each applicant upon receipt of their CAF to inform them of the current status. I, we, what we used to do is we used to just, well, sometimes when it worked, when people would submit their CAF, they just get a thing that said, thanks for submitting. Um, so they knew it like actually worked. But it's true, they didn't get told, oh, by the way, we just filled ZBA and we don't know when we might be doing it again. Or that's also the ideal place to say, look for an announcement in such and such place, because this is where we put vacancy notices. Um, but that, you know, that's each applicant upon receipt. And so hopefully, you know, we don't get deluged, right? Even though the form's simpler now and the designee just sends out like the generic email saying where we are at that particular point in the process. And it doesn't imply that they have to keep updating them, right? It's just at that moment that they put in the CAF, then whenever we do that vacancy notice, then of course the chair designee will be reaching out to them to find out their current interest. Um, so I want to pause our conversation for just a moment. So it's 1132. So we are over time. Um, my hope was that we could finish this today and have a recommendation um, for the council um, because the council would need to act on the actual community activity form request. Um, and so I imagine we won't officially change the process unless the council is going to adopt the, the revision to the CAF. Um, so I think we have two options. One is we say, yeah, we just didn't get to it today and we will pick up where we left off 
at our next meeting, which is on uh, May 11th. Um, the other option is that we go long today and try to finish this up. And so I just want to hear from the committee. I don't know what your willingness or time constraints or preferences are. So just hearing from the committee, do you want to keep going today and try to finish this up? Or do we want to sit on what we have for right now and come back to this on May 11th? Why don't I go this way? Why don't I just go down the line? <laughs> uh, Darcy. I think finishing this is going to take us, you know, longer than a half hour. Okay. Sarah. I think that, um, I think we could do it today. If you could just give us a five minute break, I'm willing to stay longer. And I think we should make a point to try to finish it. Uh, Alyssa. I'd like to try and finish it at least it or if we get to a point where we say, you know what, now we're really frustrated and we need more time to think about this, but I'm not yet. I mean, beyond this entire meeting, I'm not yet at that point. And I think that I'm actually really having gone through this SOI part. I'm really eager to say we're ready to move on. George. Let's try to finish it. Okay, so I think I'm hearing that consensus. So uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I wanna just go through the other couple of sections where I made some minor changes um, so we can look at them. I will then certainly oblige Sarah's request for a five minute break, which I think we need. And then um, we'll come back and maybe look through. What I might do is update the document to where I saw sort of majority opinion in a bunch of places. Um, and we can discuss maybe the thing as a whole. Um, okay, so, um, Three, sufficiency of the pool. The only thing that was changed here was um, two, well, no, sorry, two things were changed here. One is changing two to three. The other is a suggestion that there is a change I made that's outside of what we're talking about right now. Um, so we had, and we had debated this, and we had adopted the OCA chair or designee shall contact any applicant who submitted a CAF prior to the posting of the vacancy notice to confirm their continued interest. That had been the process that we adopted, is that we assume that anyone who submitted a CAF after the vacancy notice is definitely in the pool, but we want to contact anyone within two years. I haven't actually been following that. I've been contacting everyone who submitted a CAF, no matter how recent it was. And the reason for that is twofold. So one, in some cases, there's a big lag between the vacancy notice and when we're actually moving forward. So with planning board, there's a vacancy notice that was posted, I think, October 10th. And we didn't actually start thinking about moving forward with interviews until the end of December. So that was a, that was a big gap, right? Um, with the ZBA, technically, the first vacancy notice was published on September 12th. And then we didn't really start moving forward until March. And so I sort of felt like people who applied in December or January, that was still long enough to contact them. But the other is what I mentioned before, which is, some people submit a CAF and then a week and a half later go, oh my God, what was I thinking? I don't want to do that. Um, and so I got rid of the prior to the posting the vacancy notes to basically say any CAF, even if it was sent five days ago, you reach out and say, we're moving forward. Are you still interested? Um, because I think that, that given the experience that I've had, that's actually necessary. Is there any objection to that? Darcy, your hand is up. Is this a new hand or a residual hand? It's an old hand. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, nothing has changed in section four. Nothing has changed in section, well, the former section five, the new section six. The former section six, the new section seven. Um, I put the OCA chair shell also, I should put OCA chair or designee. Well, actually, that would. I can change that to designate. She'll also distribute to the town council all received statements of interest, um, which is just pointing out we already say they're submitting, they're distributing all these other things. Um, and then the other thing, and this would change in, with regard to what we put for uh, in section five, but one thing um, that we hadn't had in here is even though we had openly acknowledged that even after we declared the pool sufficient, we would still accept people into the pool. Um, even though we had agreed that as a committee, we had never actually written it into the process. And so this was just me formalizing something that we've already been doing, um, of course, recognizing that this would actually change slightly depending on what we 
end up doing for section five, unless I see a hand. And just that it changes substantially based on that. And, and like you said, it just has to reflect whatever we make the final decision. If it's two weeks, then it has to be enough time for them to turn in a statement of interest, right? Which was right. different than what we did just did with ZBA when it was literally like show up because we didn't have statements of interest. Okay, so I am going to put us on a short break. Um, I use that time to breathe and maybe refill your coffee. And um, I am also going to use that time to just update this based on sort of what I saw as majority opinion, and then we can go through and discuss. Uh, so with that, I will bring us back at 11.45. So we are recording again. Uh, so here's what I did um, in our little break there, is I went back to uh, the process and I took uh, the things that I had highlighted and and worked them into the process and so I took what seemed to be majority opinion now if you did not agree with that majority opinion that doesn't mean that we can't change it or change it back or alter it in some way but just to clean up what we're looking at um, I altered it to be majority opinion and so uh, let's go back. I'm going to share my screen again. So this is what the section five, instead of the full page of text, this is what the section five looks like, keeping only those things uh, that there seems to be majority opinion on. And so let me just go through them really quick. Um, so this hasn't changed this first piece, just that um, after we declare the poll sufficient, we, someone in the part of the committee contacts each applicant, solicits a statement of interest, and they include the committee handout and the selection guidance in that solicitation. Uh, there seemed to be agreement, um, it seemed to be, I think, agreement amongst all members uh, that we have sort of a standard SOI. Uh, so the only thing I changed uh, from what I'd originally presented at the beginning of this meeting is I added uh, the language that George had suggested of resumes and attachments will not be accepted. And I also, uh, I think, captured what George said, uh, the SOI shall describe why the applicant, um, so not the at a, at a minimum. Um, we, I changed the, uh, I, I put, I kept the exclusive deadline because that did seem to be where the majority of this opinion, uh, this committee's opinion landed. Um, the original language of the exclusive, of the deadline said 48 hours, I put one week. Um, because I did take on board what seemed to be the majority of the opinion, which is that we would have a bundled posting of the SOIs for the committee and for the public, and that they would be posted one week in advance of the interviews. Um, I know that was an area of a lot of discussion. I know there was not agreement there, so this very well may change, but that is where I heard, uh, that is the, the option that I heard the most support for um, in this committee. And so uh, I want to first, you know, take a second to read through this. I mean, it's all language that you, you have seen. It's just put together without the different options. Um, I'd like to hear uh, what we think, if we are comfortable with this, um, if there are changes that need to be made. Um, and then because we're nearing, I, I think, the end of this discussion, um, any changes that will be made, I think we, we might want to consider doing so as an actual vote. Um, so instead of voting on one option versus the other, we'll vote on actual text. So take a moment, look through, and I will uh, entertain, I'll open the floor and entertain any thoughts, things people like, things people want to change. The floor is open. I don't know how to raise my hand now. Oh no. Okay, well, since you're currently talking, if you have something to say, we'll hear from you and then George has his hand raised and so then we'll go to George. Great, I just wanted the little tweak um, and I appreciate the others that where it talks about the last sentence shall be posted to the interview special meeting packet. We mean the town, 
we, we mean the packet on the town website, not the SharePoint packet. And then, so we should be clear on that. And then the SOIs, so just something about just the town, I don't know. But then the SOI shall be attached to the public meeting posting to provide additional access by the public because both is it be accessible. It's just that one, it's easier to find them. So can I just add, uh, on the website, on the town website, does that get out and then to provide additional access? Does this address what you're looking for? That's, that's two ways they can find it. Okay. Uh, George, you had your hand up. Yeah, Evan, just uh, in the uh, first paragraph uh, that you've highlighted, uh, the sentence beginning, the SOI shall describe why the applicant is interested in serving on the body and we need a verb. Oh. And, <laughs> that's all right. And shall include uh, a discussion, could be, and shall include or in include a discussion of the relevant skills and experiences the applicant will bring to the body that... Um, we, we could just get rid of this, yeah. right? Well, you want it to, yeah. And certainly, yeah, please. Okay. And include? Well, it would just be they describe why they're interested and the relevant skills and experiences they will bring That's to the body. Bring the body. Okay, okay, fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, other thoughts on this, things we might want to change or add? Uh, Sarah. Okay, so again, this might be because of my headache that I don't remember, but I know that we wanted to say somewhere that the SOI is um, required, but I don't know if that's somewhere else and I'm assuming it is, but I just it just occurred to me just so that people don't think it's, oh, that'd be great if you added it extra. No, you need to have it. That I think uh -huh. just make sure that people like you know how people didn't fill out a lot of their caf this is something you know that they have that, that's all so so we have here um i just i just highlighted the highlighting um it says uh any applicant who does not submit their soi by the established deadline shall be considered withdrawn from the applicant pool does that cover or do you want stronger language no that's beautiful thank you evan um george is this residual hand or new hand that's residual, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, other additions, modifications, deletions? Evan? Yep. I think it set, should say at least both places in that paragraph, especially since I'm going to encourage you to split that paragraph into two paragraphs, um, starting so, with so all can applicants. You so see where it says at least one week in advance and then later it says one week in advance just say at least again because that way if for some reason people want to do it three weeks ahead then that works out for everybody awesome but okay other Questions, uh, or not questions, um, modifications, deletions, additions. No? I have a question. Okay, question. Um, I guess, uh, you know, just looking at this whole thing from, you know, the perspective of when we started, um, uh, for quite a while, we, we looked at the possibility of, um, of making our CAFs public records. And, um, and we looked at the Northampton um, program that does that. Um, and so we haven't, we haven't looked at that as an option with this. Um, for the CAFs that are um, filed. And I'm just sort of, you know, it kind of feels like this whole exercise is, a, is an exercise in, um, in um, 
attempting to avoid having to ever go there. <laughs> no, it's sort of a, 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 a compromise uh, offering, but um, I guess I just, I, I don't know why we looked at Northampton. I don't know what that exercise was about if we weren't interested in going the full way in making our CAF's um, public records. Um, so, so an exercise is kind of confusing to me because I don't know exactly, you know, it, it feels like it's some way to get around doing that. <laughs> well, I think, uh, oh, sorry, Alyssa, you had your hand up. Thank you, my like actual hand. I, <laughs> I know why I, I know why I was interested, and that was because I did not believe that Northampton was publishing a list of people's applications as they came in, and I was confirmed in that belief. They are not publishing people's applications as they're coming in. They are not posting them that way. That's what I was trying to confirm by finding out more about that process. What I believe we're doing now is incredibly similar to what Northampton is doing in that we are offering the valuable information to the public, to the entire council, at, that, that's actual valuable information rather than the piecemeal information we were getting on CAFs that may have been completed by someone a year or two years in the past and would not have anything to do with the selection criteria we established for now. Since Northampton doesn't publish a list of every single person who's ever applied for a committee, we also don't need to do that. And what we are doing is we are putting forward in the public way, in a way that Northampton does with what, they're, with what they call their CAF. We are doing it instead with an actual useful document, which is called the Statement of Interest. Yeah, I guess it's Thank you, Alyssa, for that. So just to, to respond, I mean, so the reason I actually wanted to do this has nothing to do with the debate over public record versus personnel records. It has to do with some issues that I think we uncovered actually carrying out our process and, and issues that we discovered with the CAS and trying to find perhaps a better way to do this. Uh, what I thought was sort of an ancillary benefit um, was that it did help bridge a compromise between um, those of us on the council who want CAS released as public documents and those of us on the council who uh, want to find, want to protect sort of uh, private information that might appear on the CAF but still give the public an idea of who's applying, uh, or who's being interviewed for these bodies. And so you described this as a, as a potential compromise and in my mind I actually kind of think it is. It, it maintains the CAS as a personnel record and therefore maintains some of that sensitive information that's on the CAF as personnel records, but the interesting, the information that's really of interest to the community is wrapped into the SOI that is a public document um, that we make available to the public, and, and I would argue even more available to the public than um, what Northampton does. And so I, I do think that this is a way of uh, not getting around that debate, but actually finding a solution to that debate that's beyond the black and white CAS or public or their personnel records, right? It finds a, a, a different solution. And so to me, this isn't trying to get around that debate. To me, this is actually finding a solution to that debate that all parties can find agreeable um, and that accomplishes the objectives of both parties that have disagreed over that. Uh, Sarah, I see your hand up. So I agree, because I think what we were trying to accomplish was that people in the public feel comfortable knowing who um, is applying for these positions and also who gets an interview. And there were complaints that people felt that they applied and then they never heard anything back and then nobody knew the pool and it seemed shady. So I think the way that we actually even did this better than Northampton is that we um, are keeping a pool which 
every single counselor gets so that if someone in your district is you know wondering you know if their application was received or whose applications are out there you can't say to someone well these are how many people that we have you can say you will get this information in a timely fashion and also i think because the chair is now um verbally and also in email responding to every single caf saying hello we did get your caf and here's the timeline in which you can expect to hear from us i think we've solved a couple of the the, the issues which were making people really feel like maybe there was you know some kind of inside fix on something so i i think that we have actually done it one step better and and I think we're doing a great job. Thank you. Yeah, to some extent, I don't. I don't want us to just say let's do what Northampton does. I want. I, I think Sarah did that well. I want to do it better. <laughs> um, and I think that this actually provides more useful information to the counselors and to the public, and finds a good balance between uh, privacy and transparency, uh, which. Back, you all might remember, if you don't, in the first meeting in September that we had, uh, we had a uh, values document that we discussed of, you know, what are the values we want to see in this process, and one of them was finding a balance between privacy and transparency, so this, this gets at that. Um, further um, additions, deletions, modifications to this section five. Okay, so then I want to go and just briefly look at the other sections. Um, so this is the section we looked at before. This looks the same. Um, the only thing I've done um, is I did add this um, that I'm highlighting now that responds to, I think, what uh, Sarah said earlier. Um, and Darcy's concerned about, well, what if they've moved or phone numbers changed or something like that and put, uh, if an individual's address or contact information has changed since they submitted a CAF, they should contact the town council to update their CAF. So they don't have to submit a new CAF every time. You just contact and you say, hey, by the way, I've moved. Uh, you should update my CAF. Um, and then, of course, this also includes um, some of the minor wordsmithing that Alyssa had suggested about uh, automatically electronically distributed to all counselors immediately. Um, so. Um, Modifications, additions, deletions from this section. Okay. Um, sufficiency of the pool. Again, the only thing that's changed has been um, two years to three years. Okay, until I see hands, I'm just going to keep running through. One thing I forgot to mention before because I forgot, uh, I didn't see it that I did change here. Um, before we had this thing that said, OCA assesses the applicant pool holistically, blah, blah, blah. OCA shall, by majority vote, declare the applicant pool sufficient to proceed to interviews. And then we said, absent this declaration, OCA may engage in outreach to recruit additional applicants. That hasn't been actually been something we've done because with both the planning board and the ZBA, even after we said the pool is sufficient, um, we were still accepting applicants. And, I, and certainly, um, and, and certainly, you know, I was still saying to people who I would talk to, even after we declared the pool sufficient, hey, if you're interested in ZBA, we're going to be appointing some members soon and you should apply. And so to me, this read as we can, we can only recruit uh, additional applicants if there isn't a declaration. And so I put before or after. Um, we could even just delete this altogether. I don't know, but I want to reflect the fact that we can still recruit additional applicants even after we declared that the pool is sufficient because just because the pool is sufficient doesn't mean that we wouldn't want more people in it. Um, I don't know any Again, this is just this is just sort of bringing our process to conformity to what we've actually uh, been doing. Uh, Alyssa. I think it's good to keep it in there. I think the clarification's good, and I think we should add OCA may continue to engage in. Because, of course, we were all doing that. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, nothing has changed in section four, nothing changed in the section formerly known as section five, now section six. Um, section seven interviews. Um, so again, this has been changed to reflect that the chair will distribute the received statements of interest to the counselors um, in addition to posting them on the packet. And then, of course, um, aligning the deadline with the posting and all of that. So this now reads, new applicants can be added to the pool up until one week before the scheduled meeting when the interview names and SOIs are added to the public meeting posting. Um, not, to me that language still feels a little clunky. Um, we can debate whether it's actually needed. Um, I, again, my original intent putting it in there was to indicate that even after you declared the pool sufficient, we still will accept people, um, but there has to be an up until, and it does make sense that that up until would be up until the deadline for the SOI, since we don't allow anyone in the pool after the SOI deadline. So if the SOI deadline is one week before, we would accept people up until one week before. Um, thoughts? Alyssa, I see your hand. I think the first section needs a little work in terms of how you understand how it works, but in terms of people who haven't been doing this understand how it works. So mm -hmm. in the very first sentence, it says, in advance of interviews, the OCA chair shall distribute. And at the end of that sentence with where it says, and committee handouts, it should say, as soon as they are available. And then the other part that you added of course, we won't have the statements of interest yet, right? Because we wrote the selection guidance, so people then have to find out what that is before they can write their statement of interest. So then you need a timeline on what you're doing with that. And so you're either adding a timeline there or you're just moving that down into the later section where we talk about one week prior to the scheduled meeting, unless you're trying to give the town council more notice than you're giving the rest of the world. So I appreciate that sentence, that new sentence, but I think it actually belongs in the next, as a clarification in the next part, because the other stuff was as soon as they were available, we don't have, there's no reason for us to hold on to the interview questions and the selection guidance once we decide what they are but we obviously don't have the statement of interest yet. And when should the town council get those? I would argue given the week timeline, they get them the same time everybody else does. Um, okay. So you, let me just ask you, are you, should that sentence? Okay. Yeah, I think, so it could stay in here. You're saying maybe it belongs in this paragraph. I would argue you don't have to say it at all because okay. the, the town council is got access to the same packet and the okay. same public posting that the public has. We're not putting them on a separate timeline. So if we're not putting them on a separate timeline, they don't need to be mentioned. Okay. Um, uh, Darcy, your hand is up. Uh, I, I don't really know why the town council wouldn't get statements of interest as they come in the same way they would get the CAFs. Right? They're co-equal. So why wouldn't they just automatically get the statements of interest? So you're saying that they, that in the same way that we get CAFs immediately, they should, it should, the OCA chair shouldn't even distribute like the, all the statement of interest, they should just go straight to all counselors? Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? So we have a couple different options on the table. I, I can't fathom why you would give it to the council ahead of time. The whole point is to have a level playing field if I, as a counselor, receive a statement of interest two weeks before I get somebody else's, it's 
asking a lot of me as one of 13 counselors to ensure that nothing that's in there is discussed with my friends who are considering applying. There's absolutely no value in giving it to the counselors ahead of time because they need to read them in context with the others. We are never looking for the perfect member of a committee. We are looking for the best members given the pool we have at this time and the circumstances we have at this time. We are not using the statement of interest as a way for someone to put their stake in the ground a week before everybody else's are published to the public. Okay, other thoughts? Just, just to answer Alyssa, I would just say we would be then um, taking a step back from where we are now with the because they do now get the CAFs automatically. So that would The reason be I would say that's not a step back, Darcy, is because the CAFs are trash, it is broken, and it does need to be fixed, and they are often two years old. So having a two-year-old CAF in your email is not useful in the same way that having a set of statements of interest is actually useful to you. So I guess, I guess what, what what we're looking at here is very similar to what we just went through with school committee, right? I mean, we, we got the bundle of statement of interest from all candidates at once. So we could sit down and say, I have all of these information. I'm going to sit down and read them all right now and compare them. Um, do, is there a feeling on this committee and I'm speaking to the full committee, but also to Darcy, since this is her suggestion that in that context with the school committee, you would have preferred to get the SOIs as they came in, even if there was, you know, a couple of weeks between them versus the, what happened where we were sent a package of SOIs. Yeah, I would, I would like to automatically get the SOIs as we got the CAFs. I'd also would like to have them all in a bundle sent to me at the appropriate time in addition to that, so that it makes it easy, just like we would have our spreadsheet of, you know, applicants that you've, you've provided in the past. So you want them as they come in, and then you also want them as a bundle. Okay, other, other thoughts? Uh, I'm going to be looking towards uh, George and Sarah to weigh in on this conversation. Sarah, I see your hand up. So to me, it seems like we're given information at a certain time. I feel that it is up to individual counselors to keep track of that information. And I, I, I don't want to be insulting, and I don't think this is what Darcy means, but in some ways, what this seems to say to me is, I want all this information so I can find it or tell somebody else, but then I want it spoon fed to me right before. And I know that's not what Darcy's saying, but that's what it feels like. And I just don't think that that's necessary. I don't think we need to put so much work on that designee. I, I think we can all keep track of that information ourselves and also, obviously, I'm a person who had an issue with how the whole school committee interviews things went down. And it's two things that I would really like to avoid. And I know that part of this is just human nature. I don't want to get SOIs in a staggered way without it being just, you know, in a bundle. And I want to make sure that we get it in enough time for town council to digest it, but not in a longer fashion where I feel like, I feel like, and, and again, this is hard for me to describe, but I feel like it wasn't just people saying, you know, from the public or even other counselors saying, I think this person has great qualifications. It went above that to the point where I feel like people were saying, uh, you would be a fool if you did not agree with me that such and such is just the best 
member ever and this is what I want to see or else. I, I don't want that to happen again and I'm, I'm not sure that we can ensure that, but I feel like the week is good. I feel like we can all do our work and keep track of our work. And I, I don't think we need to make things so redundant that it is a burden on the chair or designee. Okay, thank you. Uh, George, is there anything you'd like to add in? I feel like I'm in uh, a, a Groundhog Day, part two. Um, <laughs> we've done through this now a couple of times and I don't see anything new being added. So uh, I'm ready to proceed. Uh, I have nothing to add, and um, I think we've all pretty much said our piece here. So let's let's move on. It's getting late. It certainly is. So let me let me ask. Because one thing, one suggestion was made by Alyssa to uh, delete the language that you see highlighted in gray, which is the Oka chair shall also distribute to the town council all received statements of interest, with the idea being that they're going to be added to the packet, added to the posting the council has access to them in the same exact way that the public has access to them. Is there thoughts on that? They're added to two different places where anyone, counselor and public, has access to read them. We could also, I could also add in, you know, shall notify the council that the SOIs have been posted so that the, the designee doesn't have to take them and send them, but just says, Hey, in the same way that I, I believe I notified the council on a couple of different times, um, which weren't required, but I just said, hey, just to let y'all know, this has been posted or this has been done. So it can be just a notification. Any thoughts on this? That would be good to add. Okay. So what we're thinking then is delete. You'd be deleting that and then you could put uh, on the town council. That'd be the OCA chair or designee. How do I spell? Shall notify the town council that the SOIs post. I hate the passive ones, but we'll ignore it. That Make sense? Okay. Um, so and then nothing was added to the former section seven, current section eight. Um, George and Darcy, your hands are up. Are these residual or do you have current? Okay. Okay, so in that case, we have now gone through this as a group twice. Um, are there any final comments or do we feel like we're ready to actually take a vote? Okay, I don't. Okay. Um, so then, I'm going to propose that we move forward and actually take a vote on this. So, um, this has a lot of changes to a lot of different sections. So, I think instead of voting on the, instead of voting to amend our process, because it'd be a lot of to add and to strike and all of that, I think much like we did for the general bylaws and for that bylaw we recently looked at, um, to do a uh, rescind and replace motion would make the most sense, because um, then we don't have to have a motion that includes the language of all of these different things. Um, is that something we're amenable to? Okay, so um, I should have crafted this motion in advance. Uh, so the motion then would be to rescind the town council committee on outreach appointments communications process to recommend appointments to multiple member bodies appointed by the town council adopted 
December 9th, 2019, um, and replace it with the document proposed revision 427 2020 OCA process to recommend appointments to multiple member bodies appointed by the town council. Someone want to, so that would be the motion. I, I can make that motion. Why don't we do that? Is there a second? Second. Okay. So again, the motion on the table is to rescind the current process and replace it with this, which again is almost the same in many ways. Um, just has the additions we've talked or the changes we've talked about today. Is there any further discussion? Darcy, is this hand current or residual? Sorry, I just noticed it now. Residual. Okay. Okay, well, if there is no further discussion, uh, then I will call the question. Uh, so this is a virtual meeting, and so it must be done by roll call vote. So Brewer. Aye. Okay, Brewer's aye. Uh, Dumont. No. Ross is aye. Ryan? Aye. And Swartz? Aye. Okay, so the motion prevails four to one. Um, so the last piece of this, and I know we're way over time, but if we could just take a look at this, if we're not totally sick, I think it would be nice to be able to send this to the council as a package. Um, is related to this then would be a proposed revision of the community activity form itself. And so I gave you a mock-up of that, of what that might look like. That should be on your screen right now. So let me just run through this really quickly. The major changes um, are essentially to delete this, right? I mean, this is the stuff that would be in the statement of interest. Uh, so we would retain, you know, what, what boards are you interested in? We would retain their contact information. And then we would also retain, because I think this is a really important one, how did you hear about this opportunity? I wouldn't want to lose that question. But all these rest of them that uh, we would get rid of, and then we would retain the demographic information. Um, that's the major change, right? It's the simplification of the CAF. I also added some language that we can get rid of. Um, and this is a response to conversations that I've had with people who have gone through our process and also who have gone through the town manager's process. Um, so one is I just clarified again I, uh, um, that this form is to apply for these and if you're in and, and distinguishing because these are appointed by the town council. Um, but then I add so I added this. So I'm just going to read through it um, for the sake of everyone really quick. Community activity forms for these bodies are kept on file for three years. If you submitted a CAF for this body within the past three years, you do not need to submit a new form. So that's just telling them what we already have in the process. After you click submit, your CAF will automatically be sent to the town council. When the town council is ready to make an appointment, a counselor will reach out to you to confirm your continued interest and schedule an interview. Note that there may be a lag between when you submit your CAF and when you are contacted for an interview, depending on when the council is planning to move forward with appointments. Thank you, thank you for your patience. I'm open to, to getting rid of that. Um, the reason I put that in there is just because of commentary I've heard from the public that says, I submit a CAF and I don't know what happens next. I don't know what the process is. I don't know when I'm going to hear back. I think part of that I tried to address in the process by saying the OCA chair designee will reach out. Um, and so maybe this language is unnecessary to some extent in case I, 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 maybe it's useful to have in more places. But one thing I do want to make sure we accomplish, and this is from feedback I've heard from the community, is I don't want people to feel like they hit submit and it's in this black hole and they don't know what happens next. Um, and so that was my aim. All right, so I see a few hands up. Let's start with Sarah. I think it's beautiful and I think it's a great thing to keep in there and I think it helps feel, it helps the community feel connected to us. The one thing that I would add is something that you have done and I think that we should continue to do, which is to let them know when they hit submit, a town counselor will call them to confirm that their um, CAF was received. Okay. 
Uh, George. I wanted to make the same point as Sarah that somewhere in this statement, I think the statement should be here. I think it's a good idea. Um, should it be clearly stated that someone will reach out to them uh, very quickly to just confirm the receipt of their CAF. Um, so I think it's important that that be stated. So if it doesn't happen, um, the, the, the blame is on us. Okay. Uh... Darcy, your hand is up. No. no? Oh, okay. Um, other comments on any of this? The, oh, the only change, of course, is changing this two to three. Uh, Alyssa. So the one place where it said application, do we change the word to form? Oh, yes. Um, where was that again? <laughs> you had already told me. I think it might be at the end, actually. Yes. Okay. And um, Alyssa, you had, yeah. If I could follow up, that would be great. Please. Thank you. And um, the one thing I would like us to, to think about, to find a way to tweak just a little bit, and I sent this to, just to Evan last night in an email, is under the demographic section, is to add a statement that makes it clear that that information is not going to be personally identifiable. So please, please, please fill it out and we'll, we'll put it out in the aggregate. Evan saw what I wrote. The other part I, I of can that, pull it up too. Yeah, the other part of that is because we've literally lined out every other question other than how did you hear about this opportunity, it strikes me that that actually belongs in the optional information section not as a required item and it belongs in the optional information section for a couple of reasons one is because it's not required and two is because it actually is part of our demographic question right is that if we are only hearing from people over and over again that white people got it from the website and younger people heard it from a person or contact right that that might actually be useful information so you want to move that to here. Um, so I put the language that uh, Alyssa had emailed to me on the screen. So, so this information, the inf this information on this form is treated as a personnel record and is therefore not subject to disclosure under public records request. Demographic information will not be associated with an individual only reported in the aggregate. And so again, her goal there um, from my understanding is to make people feel more comfortable sharing demographic information because it is optional, a number of people don't um, fill it out. And if we're having it on there, that means that we believe there's some value in having it. So we want to do what we can to encourage people to fill it out. Um, is there any, let, let me say it this way, is there any opposition to adding that language? Darcy? Um. I, I find that question problematic. I've, I've actually said this before. Um, it, um, be, because, you know, we are still divided in this town, it feels like it's an opportunity to find out uh, where, you know, when you ask a person how they found out about it and they say, Joe Schmo told me about it. And you're like, oh, Joe Schmo, I'm never going to vote for that person because Joe Schmo recommended him, you know, or <laughs> um, I, 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 anyway, I, 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 I just find it problematic because that I'm sure people look at it in that way. So you want to get rid of the question, how did you find out, care about this opportunity? Okay. 
But I, I do, I mean, I do see Alyssa's point that it, it could, you know, in a well-intentioned world, be of great value to find out certain reason, you know, ways that people got the information. But I just feel like it's um, uh, um, problematic. Okay, we're going to go George and then Sarah. I take it there's no way we can change the header from optional to demographic. It has to read optional information. That's somehow required. You can't just have the header say demographic information. I can check on that um, from HR. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I know that. I don't know. So I mean, anytime you don't put that asterisk, right? It is de facto optional information, right? They're not required to fill it out. So I don't know if just because they lack the app, if we can just write demographic and, and leave it. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I would be fine with that if, if that's something that's permissible. Um, so I guess we could do, we could change that to demographic information. They won't have the asterisks and then I can ask and then if it turns out that we have to have it, we just fix it if people are on board with that. Uh, Sarah, your hand is up. Uh, Sarah, your hand was up. Yeah, so I would really like to keep this in because I think I want to know like real demographic information and real diversity. I think this whole notion of we are a council divided into two parties is is becoming incredibly tedious, and I that's it's. It's just not what we're looking for. We're looking for questions of our underserved people finding out about things and are they feeling welcome and confident in applying. Okay. Other thoughts on any of this? Uh, Alyssa? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I was really concerned actually when an applicant did that and um, feeling like it might hurt them with certain people, which of course is reflective of the reality I've talked about a number of times, which is that there's the written process and there's how we all know how we should behave as human beings. And then there's the practicality. The practicality of sending people statements of interest as they roll in is that people are going to be influenced in how they talk to their friends about how they might apply or not apply, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. Seeing a name like that is also a problem. What we did in the past, which I know everyone loves hearing about, is that if you'll recall, if any of you actually looked at the old CAFs beyond Sarah, is that they used to actually ask for references. And believe me, that definitely could have had some influence on what people said. There were three references and it specifically said, do not list the appointing authority as one of your references. So that, that was the sensitivity people had to it then, right? Like don't list the town manager and the select board chair and the town moderator as <laughs> your three references, that would be <laughs> stupid. Um, but then, you know, other times people felt really frustrated by that because they didn't know who to list. Do they list their neighbor that they're in a reading club with or who should they list? So as you can see, we got rid of that. And I don't think it was a loss to get rid of it. We could put a disclaimer on rather than asking, you know, don't specify a person, specify a method, but you know, it just gets more and more cumbersome. Yeah, I guess. Go ahead, uh, Darcy, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm just saying that that is not a bad idea, Alyssa's idea of, of um, you know, adding some language there. Um, to say like, uh, do not list names of any individual, something like that. That, that could that work because that way, if they heard about it from the CPO, they could just write, I heard some town staff told me and like, that's cool. So the idea being that they could have heard, they could say, I heard it from a friend. They could even in theory say, I heard it from a current town counselor, but they wouldn't say, I heard it from Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa Brewer told me to apply. Uh, George, I see your hand up. I just fear we're getting into overkill here, um, kind of instructing people and, um, you know, they're grownups and adults, Alyssa's right, people sometimes make bad choices, but, uh, you know, I, I prefer simpler and I don't like giving people 
making it more complicated. Just how'd you hear about it? If it was Joe Smith who told you about it, why can't you write Joe Smith's name down? As opposed to my neighbor who lives two blocks down from me, or you know, the guy who gives me coffee in the morning. I, I you know, I, I, I don't know. It's not a big deal, but I prefer. There's enough writing on this thing as it is, um, enough instruction as it is. Um, obviously, we're trying to word it in such a way that it gets us the most useful information possible. I think this is a step forward. I'd suggest leaving this off. I mean, this, do not list names. I just over overkill. So, I mean, I, 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 I will say I, I actually don't share the concern about people listing individuals' names, um, but I do understand it. Um, I don't want to lose this question, how did you hear about this opportunity? Because, and perhaps this is the scientist in me, I want data on how people are finding out about these things. Because it matters to me whether people are hearing about it from word of mouth, or from the town website, or posting on the town Facebook. Um, I, I think that's really, as we look as a council and as a community to better outreach, I think we need to know how people are finding out about this information. Um, if there are concerns about this question, I, I don't personally feel like this is necessary, but I'm open to adding it to help allay some of those concerns if it means that we can agree to keep the question. Because um, I, And I do share some of George's concern about this has now added a substantial amount of text. I am a big fan of simplifying, of assuming people won't read things. Um, but I do want to, I mean, I, I just kept hearing from people in the community that didn't know what happened once they submitted a CAF. And, and I wanted, including very recently, I had a conversation with an individual who had applied for a, a different committee um, under the town manager. And they said, I don't, I don't know how these decisions are made. I don't know what happens. And so I want that there, um, but recognizing that some people might not read it. So um, I'm okay with this if it gets us to keep this question. George would like it removed. I think Darcy and Alyssa think it should be there. Uh, I'd like to try and find some consensus on this. I don't know, Sarah, do you have any opinion on adding this, this little clause? Um, I think it's good to add the clause. That's fine with me. Keep the question and add the clause. Okay, so, so George, with your permission, maybe we'll just keep it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I think if there's no other comments, we're ready to vote. Now, this would be a, uh, what we just voted to adopt, that was our process. And so that was something we were adopting. Um, this is different. This is, a, the CAF is owned by the council. So this would have to be a recommendation to the council to revise, uh, much like we had the council revise to separate them out and have them automatically distributed. Um, so uh, the motion would be to recommend that the town council amend the town council appointed community activity form um, with the changes, with the amendments described in the document, community activity form proposed revisions 427. I think that might be motion. Um, I can make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so uh, I made the motion, George seconded. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. Uh, Dumont. No. Uh, Ross is a yes. Uh, Ryan? Yes. Swartz? Yes. And Brewer? Yes. Okay. Only about only an hour and 15 minutes over. Okay, so here's where we're at. I am going to do my absolute best to capture all of these discussions in a report to the council in a way that makes this clear um, to the council, um, which, which is going to be a task. Um, and I will hope to have that on the council's next agenda for us to at least um, update, um, even if we're not doing uh, this. Um, what I will, we next meet on May 11th. I'm hoping to use that meeting predominantly 
to look at the pool for planning board and ideally to also do selection guidance or perhaps interview questions to set us up for planning board. Um, I think that's also a time where we have to have a conversation about uh, I, this is our new process and we've just adopted it. And so um, my assumption is, unless I hear otherwise, it's with this being our new process and because we didn't put an effective date in the future that we are going to test this out now, with these planning board reappointments and asking for statements of interest. And so um, the conversation that will occur on in our next one will be moving forward with planning board reappointments and all of the things we have to do to get to um, interviews and appointments for the planning board. Um, we have minutes on our agenda. I'm going to just put those off until next meeting. They're not pressing. Uh, there is no public present and so there is no public comment. Um, and so are there any final things? Alyssa. I just wanted to make a quick thing under announcement. Sorry, it wasn't two hours ago. Associated with tonight's motion sheet for town council, you know, that other thing we were prepping for all weekend. And yeah. one of the, you might notice that the motions for appointments now say approve, reject, take no action on. The motion sheet is a constantly evolving document and trying to just reflect back to the charter, like Evan pointed out, how Board of License Commissioners said one thing for the transition period and now is another thing for the permanent. I just said that we should start saying approve, reject, take no action on, even though at this point we're not recommending take no action on. That is something the Town Council has the choice of doing. And the little charter references that were in the headers on the motions are now incorporated into the motions. And the only other thing was, you all remember how I gave Evan a hard time for people not being in alphabetical order. And I put Sharon out of alphabetical order because she's an associate because hers was a reappointment. And I was just trying to make clear that not all the associates were reappointments. But you did notice I did put them in alphabetical order. Of course I noticed. <laughs> As requested. Um, okay, thank you. So um, I will see you all again in this, I will see you all again tonight, but I will see you all again in this OCA context on May 11th. And so with that, I will adjourn our meeting at 1248 PM. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you.